good morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'm excited, I'm sure all of you are excited about the, the school year just about to begin as well. But I figured I would just, just start um, just referencing the fact that uh, you know, I got my start in the whole creative world, and you know, my passion is now creativity education. Um, and that's something that we're really focusing on at, at Adobe. But just uh, maybe a few blocks up in New York City, um, built a team uh, and you know, as an entrepreneur, a company called Behance, and the effort was to help organize and empower the creative world. So creative, uh, creative Behance is now a network of over 37 million creatives around the world and is part of Adobe. Um, and, uh, and now as Chief Product Officer at Adobe, uh, really thinking about the role of creative tools in education and, uh, and the importance of creativity in the world is something very, very top of mind these days. Um, one of the things that I've started to firmly believe is that creativity is new productivity. And, uh, and just to some context of this, because this actually sets a lot of our agenda at Adobe and, 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 and in terms of the products we're investing in and, uh, and also you know, our, um, our relationship with New York City schools, uh, is that we, you know, if you think about the last thousand years or so, people typically succeeded in their work uh, through their productivity. You know, that's where people got promoted for doing things, you know, completing tasks faster. Uh, a lot of the software that was deployed, you know, in the early age of technology was intended to help us get more things done more quickly. And, uh, and productivity um, was also something I think drove a lot of uh, educational curriculum, learning how to use products that just help you get things done uh, and, and, and accomplish tasks. And if you look at the future, you think about the role of artificial intelligence, and algorithms, and robots, you know, displacing labor, you know, oftentimes I think, how do we prepare the next generation to stand out in their careers, to uh, be able to become content creators, and start businesses, and, and get their word out? And um, you know, to me, I think that's all about creativity. It's about being able to visually express yourself, being able to tell a story, being able to you know, close a deal with a video, um, being able to make your, your make a prototype to express your ideas so that people <clears throat> feel, feel compelled to support you and understand what you're actually trying to accomplish in any form of job. So <clears throat> to me that's you know, very much one of the drivers of, uh, of our work at Adobe as it relates to education. Um, if you think about, uh, you know, should, should creativity even be confined to an art class once or twice a week, or should it be infused into the curriculum? You know, as we're writing, doing science reports and history papers and everything else, you know, why shouldn't these opportunities you know, throughout the curriculum help students learn the tools to visually express themselves and to insert creativity into whatever they become passionate about? And uh, and I, I just you know always am looking for ways to infuse creativity throughout like the broader curriculum because to me, you know, these are the skills that are going to help students. You know, stand out or, or build businesses of their own, etc. In the years to come, again, especially in the age of AI and you know, all the other technology that's meant to do productivity for us, quite frankly. So our mission at Adobe is to enable creativity for all. Um, we certainly do so with a lot of our flagship products like Photoshop, and Illustrator, Premiere Pro, etc. And um, these are all you know, industry-leading products, but they also have quite a steep learning curve. Um, I think that uh, the students who take it upon themselves to learn these tools. You know, once they figure them out, it's like a badge of honor. But we have to make these tools more accessible to more people. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to highlight quickly, because we do, you know, now have a uh, relationship with New York City schools that entitles every single faculty and student to all of our products in Creative Cloud. Not only the ones that are the, the professional and somewhat hard to learn ones, but also something new called Adobe Express. And Adobe Express has been a passion project of ours at Adobe for uh, several years. And it's really intended to outfit anyone with um, with creativity from a lot of our desktop you know, sort of industry leading tools, but in a very like easy to use web based or Chromebook based, iPad based way. Um, it all starts with templates, you know, content that you can edit to your mind's eye, you know, whatever you can imagine is possible. And we've taken all kinds of cool video editing, audio editing, you know, all kinds of cool capabilities in for students, uh, especially to be able to visually express themselves. And so it's, um, you know, it's just, again, it's something that is really one of the number one priorities of the entire company, it is the number one priority of the entire company right now. And I hope that, um, you know, I hope that you, you dig in and you, know, you let us know your feedback. And of course, um, you know, we want to make sure that we support um, your efforts to use this. Everyone is now entitled to it uh, within New York. Um, 
We also have a great education exchange, and this is a place where uh, teachers are sharing lesson plans. They're sharing all kinds of ways and experiments, things that they learned uh, to infuse the curriculum with creativity as well. So you're all invited to take advantage of that. And with that, we've also started to build a real community of educators that are committed to infusing the curriculum with creativity and finding new and novel ways to build a skill set for our students for the next generation to express themselves um, creatively. So, um, so we're certainly committed, as all of you are, I know, for the, the cause of, of uh, creativity and education and outfitting the next generation to succeed in whatever you know, they become passionate about. Um, and so it's just really an honor to be here, be a partner of all of yours you know, in this mission. And so now I really would love to uh, turn things over to New York City's Chancellor of Public Education, David Banks. Now, as a founder of a startup, I'm really impressed with David's entrepreneurial uh, approach to improving education through projects like the Eagle Academy for Young Men and others that I've, I've since learned about. Um, and among David's priorities for New York City, schools are building new career pathways and improving arts education, and we know we are really, 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 really excited about helping him and all of you achieve these goals. And so with that, David. What are you invited? Just by, uh, just to help you understand who's in the room, how many of you are actually educators in our schools, just by show of hands? Everybody else just cares deeply about education, right? <laughs> and you're connected in, in a whole host of, uh, of different ways. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, City and State for inviting me to be here and give me the opportunity to share a little bit about the vision that we have uh, for the New York City Public Schools. Uh, and by the way, I, it's a term that I'm trying to use more and more and asking that you do the same as well. Instead of the Department of Education, Department of Education um, denotes bureaucracy, machine, uh, impersonal. But New York City public schools, it's a very different field, doesn't it? You know, we're the only city in the nation that refers to our school system as the Department of. You go to Atlanta, it's Atlanta Public Schools. You go to Chicago, Chicago Public Schools. Denver Public Schools. And so now going forward, we're really trying to push that forward. New York City public schools, and it makes a difference. Language matters. Uh, I want to first of all, before I even get started, acknowledge some of the senior leadership from my team, uh, who I guess didn't have anything else to do, so they decided to come here. <laughs> Our first deputy chancellor, Dan Weisberg, please stand, Dan. <laughs> Our deputy chancellor uh, for early childhood, Dr. Kara Ahmed. So for leadership, uh, Dr. Desmond Blackburn. So they will be here uh, also as we uh, wrap up. Please uh, avail yourselves of them and their great expertise. None of this work, nothing that I'm about to share with you happens uh, without them. And I deeply appreciate them for signing on uh, for this August test that we have. So, um, <laughs> David and Philip Banks, circa 1971, um, graduates of PS 161 in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, District 17. Yeah, yeah, I, I like to show that just to remind myself from time to time when I used to have hair. Uh, my mom and dad raised three boys in Brooklyn. I'm the oldest of three. My, well, watch this, my brother Philip and I were born in the same year. Okay, y'all do, do the math on that one. Uh, I was born in January. Philip came 11 months uh, later. And, uh, and as I asked my, my dad when I got older, and I was like, Dad, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> he said, well, son, I just loved your mother very, very much. <laughs> the reason I raised this is because I posit this question to all of you. 
Why do we send our children to our public schools in the first place? Right? But we need to we need to fully grapple with that very notion. I talk about the fact that when kids are playing sports, it's very clear why they will do all the practice that they do. They'll do the wind sprints. They'll do all of the hard work because they're very clear what the goal is. The goal is to win the game. The goal is to win the championship. It's clear. So we will work together as a team, and we will sacrifice, and we will be disciplined to win the game. We're, we've not been clear in education. What are we trying? What are we doing this for? We do a lot of what I call schooling, but not necessarily educating, and certainly not making it clear for all of our young people about why we do this every day. I visit far too many schools, great people, and I sit down next to young people in fourth grade, seventh grade, 11th grade, and too many of the responses that I get back from them when I ask them about what they're engaged in is, I'm doing what? My work. Doing my work is cold for, I don't know why I'm doing this, I'm doing it because I'm being compliant. It's an assignment. The teacher said, do this, we're doing it. But they don't make the deeper connections to why they're doing it. And I don't think we as educators have even come close to helping all of our young people understand about why we do this. And so for me, um, as I've spoken to parents and teachers and students all across the city, uh, we frame what we think is our mission for this administration. And that is ultimately that every one of our students will graduate on a pathway to a rewarding career, long-term economic security, and, a, and to be a force for change in their communities. So at least there's some level of clarity. I don't believe in just going to school for school's sake. I think learning is wonderful and it's great. If you come into our schools in kindergarten, you stay all the way through the 12th grade, we've spent close to $350,000 per student. So the question that you should all be asking is, what's the return on investment? What, what, what are the kinds of young people that we ought to be producing? What should we expect as we hand them that diploma and we offer up a hearty congratulations? They, they should know some stuff, right? Are y'all with me? <laughs> they, they should be able to do some things. <coughs> That's certainly my expectation. But we have coined the phrase that this administration is focused on bright starts and bold futures. And so the bright starts really is about the literacy foundation. You don't get to bold futures and opportunities at places like Adobe unless you have established, at the very least, a solid literacy foundation. This is a guy named Bill Gunlock. He's a man, uh, Tom, who you know, got his picture there. He stands in front of Tweed. He's been standing out in front of Tweed almost every day for 10 years, holding up that very simple sign, reminding us about the importance of teaching our kids to read. And when I became chancellor, I, I approached him with my second day, and I saw him standing there, and I was told he's out here every day, rain or shine. And most people think he's crazy. But he was a teacher for 27 years in Ohio. And he said to me, and I went over to him, I said, I agree with you. I, I, and we, we got to make sure that all of our kids learn to read. He said, it would solve almost all of your problems. You're spending so much money as a system um, trying to play catch up. But if you ensure that everyone learned how to read at the earliest grades, you wouldn't have to spend so much, you're wasting so much money on the other end. He said, by the way, I just want you to know, I've been out here for 10 years. You're the first chancellor that's even said a word to me. They see me every single day, and they've avoided me for 10 years. I thank you for even at least acknowledging my presence. And so the simple but profound message from a Bill Gunlock is about the fact that we kind of lost our way. The New York City school system used to produce young people who could read. 25, 30 years ago, we kind of got off course, I believe. We have smart, committed, dedicated educators all across the system. Absolutely. By and large, 
they have not been the problem. Their problem has been the approach. The tools that we have provided to them to ensure that every student will read. Listen to this. As of 2019, only 35% of black students, 36.5% of Latino students, and 9% of multilingual learners scored at proficiency level on ELA exams in grades 3 to 8. Think about that. We have a budget with $38 billion. There should be one child that can't read. The, the, the failure is our failure. And it's a failure that we intend to fix. For black boys, it's only been 28.4%. It's part of the reason what took me into the work of the Eagle Academy. And my dedication to, I didn't have all the answers, but I was dedicated to at the very least being in it to try to figure it out. How do you engage? You can't continue to leave this much wasted human capital on the sidelines and think that our nation will be able to continue to economically compete at the level that it is supposed to. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a phonics-based foundational literacy curriculum. And all schools now have ordered a DOE-approved curriculum. 210 secondary schools and around 200 elementary schools with low literacy rates will have coaches embedded in their schools to ensure implementation of the curriculum. There will be citywide professional training on dyslexia. You've heard the mayor talk about this at length. The amount of students that uh, are dyslexic that have gone undiagnosed for so many years and we just continue to move them through a system. And they don't disappear. They wind up filling the ranks at Rikers Island and other places. The system, we either pay now or you will pay later. But we will pay. And I'm suggesting that we pay less if we do it the right way on the early side of this rather than on the late side. We've also created an advisory council on literacy which I'm really happy about, which includes some of our most successful teachers, to make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to ensure that all of our students become capable readers. This is very, very important to me. When I'm done as chancellor, if I want to be able to point to, there are going to be two things that I'm really looking to point to. One of them is to ensure that every one of our children was really now on a path in terms of reading proficiency. There was no excuses about not learning how to read. So across all literacy and all subjects, we will have a culturally responsive curriculum that is relevant to all students, where they can see themselves reflected in the literature. Critically important. <laughs> <laughs> said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. All the other possibilities of life open up for you, but they are deeply diminished if you haven't established a solid foundation in reading. So you will continue to hear me in this administration talk about that. We've got plans. We're going to be driving that work uh, through our superintendents and our principals and our schools all across the city. So you heard me say that the theme was bright starts and bold futures. <laughs> I think about this. In 2009, I don't know how many of you clearly can see it from that end, but in 2009, almost 80,000 students started high school in our ninth grade across New York City. 80,000. Think about this. Four years later, we graduated about 67% of those students. Then we gave that group six years to graduate from college. We only graduated 18,000 students of that original 80,000 from college. It's about 23%. The, so the message, so first of all, we're not even doing our college-going work well. But I'm suggesting to you that the college-going work should not be the only thing that we're talking about. We have to talk about putting our kids on a path to real career pathways where they each graduate with a strong post-secondary plan whether they decide to go to college or not. They should have the tools and the skills that they need to get off, as I say, get off mommy and daddy's uh, payroll. <laughs> and that's going to be critically important that we do that. And so central to our reimagination of learning is a new initiative and a set of commitments to students and families that we're calling Student Pathways to Economic Security. This is the bold futures that I'm talking about. 
We're going to put them on a path to rewarding careers. This is our North Star. This is where you're going to see the focus, the resources, the energy, the dramatic change that is going to begin to take place in our schools is focused around this body of work. Our plan will activate students' passions and their purpose by connecting them to careers in the world beyond the classroom. In the wake of the pandemic, we've seen enrollment, enrollment fall and chronic absences rise. That's in part because schools aren't speaking to students' passions and purpose or connecting them to the real world. You know, this 21st century economy and these jobs that are out here now, you know, Scott, what you're talking about, Adobe, and there's so many others. That's the real world. That's where the opportunities are for our young people. And we've done very little to prepare young people for, for those opportunities. There's a level of skill development that they have to have. Career-connected learning is going to ensure that New York City public school students will graduate with those real-world skills and experiences. It's going to give them a head start towards college and careers. We're going to achieve this by building new high school pathways aligned with good jobs that meet a set of standardized criteria, including college credit, industry credentials, 21st century skills, and real world work experiences starting in healthcare, tech, and education. It's not enough to talk to young people about the opportunity. They have to be exposed to the opportunity. That's what gets the light to go on. When, we, when I was at the Eagle Academy, I bring in guest speakers from all kinds of industry. I told every one of them before they engage with my young men, they're going to ask you how much money you make. <laughs> and you better be real with them. You don't have to tell them your specific salary. But you've got to help them understand the possibilities. Telling them, well, it's not about how much money you make, it's just about ensuring that you are fulfilling life and you know, you're on the path to the things that really matter to you and your value. Yes, said, you know what kids hear when they hear that? They hear, well, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> you have to keep it real. Tell them about the possibilities, and you could make this kind of money in this industry. Because that's what they hear about in the drug game. That's what they hear about in the music industry. Which is, you know, the music industry is great. But we need to increase the opportunities of exposure. There's all kinds of opportunities for them that they would work toward. They would work really hard in school if they knew. They don't. And so that's what we have to do. We're going to partner with intermediaries to meaningfully scale high quality paid internships and apprenticeships through engaged and committed employer partnerships. We're going to set shared metrics and goals to measure progress and hold partners accountable. We're going to pilot and scale dedicated career advising to ensure that all students spend meaningful time with a trained advisor to understand their personal interests, needs, and challenges and guide them as they prepare for and navigate through their next phase of life. We're not playing at school, ladies and gentlemen. School should have a real purpose and we ought to develop every single day toward that purpose. We're going to be working to develop our teachers' exposure as well, because that is also one of the major gaps. Many of our teachers have no exposure to what it means to work in a place like Google or Microsoft or Adobe. They, have no, they don't have any idea about it. So how are they supposed to help to drive all of our students' uh, experiences and skill development to places and spaces that they don't know anything about? That's what I mean when I say you, the use of technology has to take us outside of the four walls of school. There's a great world out there. And they need to understand that climate change is real. And they have to take their rightful place in being the folks who are going to be the problem solvers for that. And real world issues. But we can't tell them we don't have time to do that because we got to get back to it. So I, I've just got a couple more minutes. I know I'm already over time. I've been a long time member of the 100 Black Men Organizations in national, in fact, international organizations. And this is one of their biggest mantras, which is uh, as we deal with young people, they will be what they see. It's not enough to talk to them about careers. 
You've got to create real opportunities for them to see it, touch it, be engaged in it. That's what creates the aha moments for them. And that's when we're going to do a better job. So what will all this mean to the lives of our students? As we go into this school year, middle school is going to have a chance to explore what careers could look like and start learning about the world of work from middle school. Tenth graders in schools across the city will be in our New York City career launch program, starting on pathways in high growth fields like tech, healthcare, and education. They'll be getting coursework connected to future careers, college credits, and paid internships, alongside support from advisors and teachers to help launch them into careers and life after high school. 11th graders will be going to apprenticeships, learning how to apply the coding skills that they've learned in school to the real world. And we'll start growing career and technical education programs. CTE, this is not your granddad CTE. This is not just wood shop. This is real stuff that there are real jobs where young people can come right out of high school and step right into the world of work and put themselves on the path to the middle class and beyond. That ought to be what our purpose in being the New York City public school system should really be all about. And of course, you know, all of this must be bolstered by our kids learning 21st century skills, including financial literacy. We need, we need each of our students to graduate ready to build a budget, Pay their taxes, say amen somebody, <laughs> and be on their way to economic security. That's why, learning from experiences in these CTE programs, we're going to be piloting new programs to scale up financial and digital, digital literacy this year. We won't be doing all this at once for everyone. We'll be testing the best ways to build this out. And with input from parents, students, teachers, educators, and the community leaders along the way. And throughout this work, this school year, we will have a whole host of metrics and very specific measurables that we will be working uh, toward. And so, just in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap up, and I want uh, Jay Grieve to please stand. Jay? Jay? Our chief of student pathways and she's built out a brand new office for us that is fully dedicated to this work we're not playing with this stuff y'all I want you to know that and so that's why I put Jay we're going to keep this because her uh, her email is up is there and so for those of you who are here um, who need to see her get a card or whatever please see Jay for those who don't get to see her reach her that's why we put a picture up on the board with her email. Okay, so please feel free to be in touch with her, to email her. Uh, she is driving this work for us. She studied this work all across the world. Germany and Switzerland, the people who have connected public education to the workforce in real and meaningful ways. And we want to begin that process here. This is going to be the legacy work for this administration. We're going to have bright starts and what? Oh, bright starts and what? Oh, I appreciate that. And we want to continue to spread that word, get the word out, let people know. If you have any partnership, if you have any business, if you have a not-for-profit, and you see yourself being able to play a role, we are looking for partners in this work. I made it very clear where we're going, what we're trying to accomplish, and we need partners like many of you in this room to help us, if you know others, in the business community, wherever they are. We are open for business, and we can't do this work without you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. such an enthusiastic conversation. My name is Dr. Keisha King. I'm the head of education for T-Mobile, both K-12 and higher education. Previously, previously having been uh, a teacher and a principal, I always say a forever educator, a teacher and a principal, 
and an executive director of curriculum and technology in a school district of 90,000 students, 96% uh, free and reduced lunch in Houston, Texas. So I know all too well some of the uh, intricacies of our public education system. Uh, now in T-Mobile, uh, they asked me to come in a few years ago, about four years ago, and they said, hey, can you come and help us figure out this education thing? And I said, um, sure, are we, are we gonna really talk about kids? <laughs> That's the only way that I can do it. And so um, when I joined T-Mobile, we had, we had provided connectivity and technical solutions for about 10,000 students. Today, we've connected over 4 million students. <laughs> it's a really exciting adventure. And um, you know, I just want to tell a, a quick story, because Chancellor Banks mentioned something about um, the deeper connection and why we do this work. And many of you have, have worked with several um, of the folks in the room. And there's a reason why we do this work. And for me it is thinking about third grade. Third grade was a very special time for me, right? I had done, and I'm sure many of you, there, that's that critical point of literacy where, you know, it, it kind of makes or breaks what happens after that. And in the third grade for me, I remember being in choir. And I was in choir for a whole school year. We practiced and practiced and practiced this one song. And I was so excited when it came time to sing that song. And uh, we had to get $5 for our shirt and, you know, be ready on, you know, a Thursday to go up and sing the song in front of the community and the parents and everyone that was there. And I went home and I asked my parents for the $5 for the shirt. And I said, well, we'll have it for you. We'll give it to you on Monday. Monday came, and they didn't have the $5 for the shirt. And the, sh the $5 was due on Tuesday. Tuesday came, you know, and I said, hey, I really need the $5 for the shirt. And they didn't have the $5 for the shirt. And I got to school on Tuesday, and I had to tell my teachers that I didn't have the $5 for the shirt after the whole school year of practicing the song. And I, at the end of the day, I ended up sitting in the audience, listening to the rest of my classmates in third grade sing that song. And that song was, this land is your land. Do you remember that song? So sing the song. <laughs> this land is my land. California to the right. It was a very, it was a very special sign. I never forgot the song. But all it would have took that day was one person to advocate for me. Right. So this is a really special opportunity. Not only the work I do every day for T-Mobile, but the work that I do specifically on behalf of New York City students and the work that each and every one of you does specifically for children that need one advocate, right? This is a very, very special moment. So I wanted to start off with that and say, you know, I, I, I want to ensure that the work that T-Mobile does across the country is representative of the direction that we need to be going on behalf of American students. We have a $10.8 billion commitment to provide student connectivity to K-12 students um, in every single state of the country. That commitment is a five-year commitment for connectivity. Right here in New York City, we've worked with New York City Public Schools to connect over 600,000 students since the start of the pandemic. New York City Public Schools was the very first entity in the country to decide to solve the digital divide at the start of the pandemic. The very first. So this is a very special opportunity. Also having been invited to join the United Way, the New York City of United Way's Education Equity Cabinet by uh, Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright and her team. And so I'm really excited to be deeply in involved in the work that we do here. Something that uh, Chancellor Banks mentioned kind of resonated with me. And it was about creating um, foundational curricular structures to ensure that our students are learning and growing appropriately and have access to a future workforce that they otherwise would not have access to. There's a saying that I use traditionally when I'm talking with school districts and educators and work with a little bit over 5,000 
uh, school districts and state entities across the country. And that is, curriculum is the foundation, sound pedagogy is the method, and technology and connectivity is the support. There is no replacement for sound pedagogy. There is no replacement for effective teaching and learning and curriculum that serves our students. So when we hear from our amazing partners at Adobe and Google and all these other amazing education software providers, at the core of that are our teachers. At the core of that is how we're designing teaching and learning structures so that they can do great work to support us. 65% of our children will not have access to the innovative future workforce that Chancellor Banks told about. How can we change that? How do we collectively work together to ensure that as we provide connectivity, as we invest in all these resources and spend billions of dollars to improve our 5G footprint and our network access and all of the devices from Chromebooks to iPads to laptops, how do we ensure that those devices actually contribute to our students gaining academic vocabulary, gaining access to immersive experiences, XR technology, right? And I'm not talking about just opportunities to see it. Opportunities to hold it and impact it and change the way that it speaks to our communities. When they walk into an immersive world, who's there to create that immersive world? that ensures that it speaks to our students' um, experiences, right? If they're not there, if they don't have a seat in the creation of the opportunities, the opportunities are much less likely to speak to them. Lastly, there's an education ecosystem that um, I think we don't talk about a lot. When we connect students, we don't only connect that child. We connect <laughs> Uh, government agencies that serve them, right? Speaking to housing insecurities, food insecurities, transportation insecurities. We connect the industries and businesses that serve them. Speaking about our grocery stores, our local mom and pops or uh, operations, right? All of the different entities and organizations and businesses that serve them. We're talking about connecting our uh, school districts and all of the curricular resources, right? Right underneath there is providing that connectivity and access. And last, definitely but not least, we're talking about connecting the community. All the nonprofits that step up and say, I want to be boots on the ground, and I want to solve something for these students, right? That is what providing students with connectivity does. It is not simply a hotspot. It's not simply um, just this, this service that's a layer underneath it all. It is really driving economic change across these communities. Lastly, as we work with school districts, it's really critical that we get back to the core of database decision making and database um, uh, spending with regards to providing resources that connect students. And a part of that is ensuring that we're aligning connectivity to student learning objectives. How is connectivity impacting academic achievement, attendance, student motivation and engagement? How is it driving success across all of the different variables that we're seeking to measure in education? And that's a part of T-Mobile's commitment. So Project 10 Million is the opportunity for you to go to tmobile.com slash p10m and we will provide every single student household that has that qualifies for the National School Lunch Program with one no-cost hotspot and five years of 100 gigs per year of internet access. That is not <laughs> one thing that New York City Public Schools did is provide completely unlimited access, which is a, a different model of ensuring digital equity across the board. But what Project 10 Million does seek to do underneath it all is ensure that if there is access to nothing, that that student can go online and that family can go online and have access to that hotspot being sent directly to the home. So I'm really excited to be present today. I'm excited to work with so, so many of you and just really proud of the work that you're doing, uh, Chancellor Benson, and your team.
and everyone else in the room. Thank you so much. We know from research that the teacher is the most important in school factor for student learning. The teacher's belief about the students, the teacher's effectiveness. We also know that teaching has become an incredibly challenging profession. Um, and, you know, perceptions of the profession has become very mixed. So I, I, I'd like to just kind of start with Commissioner Rosa. What can we do uh, to help our teachers? But also, uh, what can we do to elevate the profession in New York State? Well, first, let, let me start by saying, um, you know, to your, com to your comments about those issues and the next step in, into schools and school buildings, that those are many of the same issues that we grapple with. I mean, those are the very core of many of our issues, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that we are in a moment that, um, you know, you talk about elevating the profession as if, you know, in some ways I, I hear that language all the time and it's unsettling for me because it's almost as if the profession is not treated or looked at. You know, um, Jessel Banks said language matters. I think we use a lot of, of, of uh, phrases and uh, language that really in many ways um, really diminishes and takes the profession for granted in many ways and takes the profession to a place as if, you know, there's this uh, messaging out there that who wants to be a teacher? You can only be a teacher if you can't be A, B, C, D, you know, if you can't go into technology, if you can't go in, when in fact it is one of the most noble, everyone sitting in this room, if you close your eyes, you can attribute many of your own belief system, besides your parents and your family, and your core, to many of those individuals that have touched your lives as you've gone through school reading and as you've gone through the experience of teaching and learning. I do think we have to really change the narrative about, one, about teaching, two, about the way we recruit teachers, the way we support teachers during uh, and sustain them, and the way we help them rethink, rebuild, and really truly re-engage and love what they do. And so part of that is uh, financial and, and you know, what we pay them. Second is how we treat them, how we speak about teachers, and what are our expectations uh, in terms of teaching, and how we're seeing it throughout this country right now, how we are putting guardrails on many of our teachers teaching in terms of critical thinking, in terms of how they teach history, the, the complete history, not the single story. So I really truly believe that we have to take the language that we use, one, to describe teachers, two, how we think about teachers, and three, the incentives and instead of thinking about how we elevate those teachers, we should be thinking about, my God, they are, they should be thought about as individuals, especially during this pandemic. They were first responders in those schools. They were first responders in communities. And they were first responders to children, social, emotional, as well as putting their masks on the children first in many kinds of situations. So I think we have to create a new narrative of one, how we think about teaching the profession. It is a profession, and we treat it as if it's a sub category, and if it's as if it's not a profession. And so I really think the narrative has to shift, um, and we have to do a better job in recruiting early on, celebrating and sharing, you know, uh, somebody talked about money. Many of our teachers don't go into this profession because of money. Many of these teachers go into profession because many of them had wonderful people in their lives and they want to make a difference and give back. So I think we do have to honor not just the money aspect, but we have to honor the aspect of those individuals who want to be in those classrooms and want to bring what I call the joy 
in joy of our students and our communities. So I, I would start by saying, let's shift the narrative. Let's really, truly make a, an effort to create a profession and not talk so much about elevating it, but really having it take its place at the table. Because right now we're treating it as if they are outside the door trying to get in. And, and in some cases, they're not even pulling a chair uh, to the table. So I would submit that we have to truly, truly do a better job in how we speak about our teachers, our educators, and people who really go into this work. Because this is God's work. Thank you. Council Member Joseph was definitely one of those first responders. So, um, a year ago, how could you have been supported better? I'm giving the tools that I needed in my tool. I had to go out and seek for them on my own. I didn't have that support. It's Dr. Rose's comment. Amen. The messaging. See how the Chancellor said New York City Public Schools? Educators need to be uplifted, not only uplifted, celebrated every day. During the pandemic, I celebrated my teachers. I, I, I'm not a principal, but however, they were my colleagues. I called in. I know those, especially those that were struggling with the technology piece, I would call in this wellness check. Just like my students, they would get a wellness check in the morning. When I go online and I go through all the classes, because I was also the ENL coordinator for my building, I wore many hats just to make sure that my kids would get the resources that they need. So I would call my teachers like, how are you today? Are you able to log in? Do you need me to come in and provide tech support for you? Do you need me to come in? I call parents, do you need me to come in? Um, that's the job we did. Um, when I started in 1999, my starting salary was $31,000. The first check I got, I cried. Because at the time, I was working at the United Nations and I wanted to leave that profession to come in and make a difference. Because my grandparents raised me and they were like, you gotta give back. So through education, I wanted to give back. And when I went into my school building, I went to a district that was affluent. And when I walked into my school building, I was like, oh no, this is gonna happen. And I started working to make changes. And I said, if I ever taught at a school, my kids should be able to attend that school. And that's what I did. And like you, I created the first de facto community school to bring in the resources and the partnerships with the not-for-profits and the corporates to make sure that my students had the support that they needed, from eyeglasses to dental wear, to backpack, to food, to whatever was needed to remove some of those barriers. And as I was teaching, and I noticed, started noticing more of my students entering the shelter system. So I had a lot of my students who were also living in temporary housing. So make sure that PS6 was a place that removed the barriers to allow our students to thrive. So there, there, Ms. Joseph is here at the table. Dr. Rosa, they, I brought a chair and a table to, yeah. to sit for my educators. Yeah. Um, how do we get those kind of messaging out to the broader public? Well, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I mean, I've done um, you know, probably 100 polls over the years uh, on education issues. Every time we ask and say, who's the most trusted source of information about education, people say teachers. And so in the general, when you kind of ask, if people have a favorable, unfavorable impression of their teachers, very favorable. If you think about the psychology of it, you know, as parents, we all send our children off. Off they go to school, right? And then they're with a the teacher. So the psychology on um, wanting to be invested in that teacher, wanting that teacher to do a good job, um, is really, really high. And I think the pandemic underlined, not that it needed to be underlined, but it probably did for some, about how hard it is to work, work with students. And kind of like a, a reminder that none of us should have needed, but some of us probably got um, around. around. So I think there's a generally, for exactly the reasons you were saying it about the kind of way that teachers, for many of us, exist in a very special place. Um, but then we get to the kind of, well, what's going on publicly um, with teachers. And, and you know, in New York State, less than half of parents know about teacher shortages. And so if you also have, I, mean, I don't know where we are in New York City in terms of teacher shortages, but parents don't um, know about uh, that. And obviously there's issues around pay and profession. And I've seen like all around the country, um, public health professionals and education professionals are leaving um, because of how brutal the last three years where they ought to just 
be honest about that. We, it, it, COVID affected everybody, but it didn't affect everybody the same way. And how, how we started, how we came in, and who we are, and where we live, all sorts of things affected how this pandemic, and for teachers, and, you know, if we were talking about, um, you know, nursing, there's a different thing we could say the same thing, but I do think there needs to be a kind of a focus on how do we bring in to the profession something which is not only, it's historically been low pay within the kind of professional things that teachers could be making elsewhere, but now has this added thing that it's like the hardest possible to imagine job, and we've got to really have our teachers, and, 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 and principals and educators are really, really squeezed, and we're going to have to figure out how to recruit um, people, bring them up, and, and, um, um, and support them under there. Can I, can I just add to something you said? When, when you look at the situation, right, parents were struggling with two, three, four, five kids. Teachers have 25, 30, and, and they're they're trying to personalize, individualize those relationships. And so I think in some ways parents got it. Oh my God, I'm struggling with two kids, three kids, four kids. Imagine how that teacher navigates that space, that classroom, with 25 or 30 kids. That's one. The second thing is there's a gender issue here. Let's be real. Let's tell it. Yes. There is a huge yes. gender issue. Teaching is a female profession. I became a, a high school principal, a middle school principal, and I have to tell you, even in the superintendency, it is you see very few females. I mean, I think when I was a high school principal, it was one of the few. And the same thing uh, when, you know, particularly in high school and stuff. So it is as nurturing women, we love the profession. We love, you know, the idea, and it works because we have to make family choices in many situations, right? So it is a gender situation, and for males, on the other hand, you know, they they carve a path of saying, yeah, I'll be a teacher for a few years, and then I want to be assistant principal, principal, so da, 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 and so forth down the line. As a matter of fact, I think I'm the second female commissioner in 200 and some odd years, so you can well imagine that. I, and again, the second chance are gender differences in the narrative and our gender differences in climbing the ladder of success. So I would say, young women who are in the teaching profession, you know what? Ask your partners, whatever, you know, when, it, when the kids come along, you know, like I said to my husband, you know, hold your nose and change the diaper, and I'm going to work. You know, because in truth, you know, you've got to create that relationship in terms of giving women opportunities, because there is one thing we bring to the table, and that's that you're nurturing, uh, and I'm not saying men, that you're not in touch with the feminine side of you, or that you don't nurture, but women, for the most part, have been in this profession as caregivers and caretakers. All right, wow. Okay, I wanted to follow all of that up. All right, <laughs> perfect. Now, let's, let's really challenge this crew here. Um, I've got a few different themes that are all coming in, so I'm going to just smash them all together and see how they handle them. There's, some of you all have written some questions about how uh, not-for-profits, community organizations, private organizations, can better support public schools. So hold that here in a nugget, because that's a question all its own, but we don't have time to get all these. Uh, Chancellor Banks talked about the need for all kids reading by third grade, um, and there are a couple questions here about science of reading and implementation of the right kind of reading instruction across New York City. Let's, let's bottle that up there. Uh, and, and there's even uh, some questions about, about what can we do for teachers who serve, you know, children who are just struggling to read in those first few years. So maybe blending those different topics together. You know, um, what are some solutions for meeting Chancellor uh, Banks' goals and all of our goals of all kids reading by the end of third grade? Well, I think making sure, one of the things I talked about a lot when we roll out the curriculums, engage the educators. Professional development will be very important. And another factor we always leave out, which is very important, 
engage the parents. And that was one of the things um, we did at my school. When we noticed that we were serving such a high immigrant population that was not speaking English, we created an ESL evening program for our parents to come in and be engaged in part of that process because they get intimidated when you roll out new curriculum. Engage your parents, your stakeholders. Um, make sure that they are also part of the process because once they leave us, they go home. Home was the first school. That's how I was raised. The, the home was the first school. So if we engage the parent, we also teach them how to support the student and the teacher. Um, I, I think it would work so much better. And early intervention, data, data must also drive how we do this. I've always said data drives my instruction, data also drives how I make policies. So I think data will also be very important in how we capture. And children are not cookie cutters. We can't, what works for one may not work for the other. So we have to make sure that we are meeting that, that need there as well. So as an educator, 25 of my 35 kids at the time that was sitting in front of me was never taught the same. They all taught and I knew how to group them properly to make sure that they were doing the same thing for one another, uh, vice versa. So I'm going to take it, um, I'm going to pick up what you just said and use the information and the tools that you look at to do this. I think what we have wrong in schools is that we have these barriers, these artificial grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five, move from period one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, all of those are artificial barriers that assume that there's a standardization of development growth. And there isn't. How many, cho how many children may not read immediately, and then somewhere along the line, maybe by third grade, they become avid readers, right? because there were natural curiosity was elsewhere. So I think we have to rethink about these standardizations that we have, these buckets that we have about what how learning happens and use the brain research that's out there to really guide the work and, and really, uh, really break loose. I think technology helps us do that break loose from the morning person to the evening person of students, the one that learns by you know different modalities, right? Set up your spaces so that you are customizing that those learning opportunities. I think that too many times we you know we set these these goals and barriers and then we panic. Uh, yes, I do believe in the pre-work that you have to, you know, using the clinical model, you have to assess early on in order to look at preventing so that you're not retrofitting later on. But I would say we also have to examine our structures. Our structures are barriers for many, many children who learn by doing, who learn a different way. And what we do is schooling has been so uh, a customized for those students that learn by you know being visual right some of them their auditory skills you know they want to read it and we continue to lecture right so I think we have to examine our practices and we have we have to examine brain research we have to examine our practices how we deliver instruction and we have to examine our spaces and how and what time and all those elements that get in the way. You have a great teaching lesson going on, and then click, you've got to stop, because you've got to move on to. We also have to learn how to integrate. You know, science is connected to reading, reading is connected to math, so that measurement and mathematics should be connected to measurement and reading. So it's connected in science. Let's stop isolating these, these content areas, these buckets, and then you get to high school and you say, oh my god, biology is, chemistry and bi biology so you know, come together. Yeah, let's think system-wide. Let's think of organ-wise. And let's create a school system that truly has one high school, I'm going to quote it, use, that I visited, that I was so impressed with, with a very uh, large poverty area. Uh, that said, high expectations are meaningless without rich opportunities 
that are personalized, not standardized. And so for me, it's revisiting our structures. If we don't change our structures and we don't change our use our research in terms of brain research and child development, then all we're doing is we're setting these goals of by this, by this, by this, and guess what? I don't know anybody who gets to California on a bike in five hours. So let's make sure that we set up our goals and objectives and align them to an action strategy that really supports the accomplishment and the outcomes that we expect. Thank you. Yeah, there are some great nuggets there. You know, about the use of data, personalization, maybe breaking down traditional barriers. Um, one of the elements of the question was really thinking about so many of you all represent uh, private organizations, partnerships. Uh, I, I, I recall an event that uh, our data analytics team discovered of a group of over 100 schools in New York that were getting disproportionate outcomes uh, with their early readers. And uh, we discovered they partnered with the Robin Hood Foundation and Education Fund uh, to leverage artificial intelligence technologies uh, through a resource called Mira to help work as a teacher's assistant to allow for this kind of personalization that you're hearing about. So when the partnerships come about, they provide the teachers the right kind of resources. These types of realizations that we're hearing uh, from Rita and Betty can really come about. Well, I'm going to shift to always the year's most popular topics. And leading this panel, by far and away, the stack of papers always is dominated by school funding. right? And it's like, I think it's because every year there's a certain element of unpredictability. What's going to be next? What's our resources going to look like? How do we plan? And, and obviously in New York, this has been no different uh, with, with much discussions about how to more equitably address school funding. Uh, so given it's such a popular topic, you know, I'm, I'm wondering who would like to take it on first. And, and then Jeff, I really want some nuggets about how the public sees this different than maybe the educators in this group. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Council Member Joseph, you want to take take it first pass at this one? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone is watching the news right in the middle of a, a tight budget. But to me, the budget this budget battle brought about three things for me. We are definitely have to restore that, and I've said it loud and clear. Possibly restore it. But however, we must also look at the policies that brought us here. So one of the things we did, along with the Chancellor, um, we created a working group to reimagine FSI. We can no longer continue to fund New York City schools with a formula that's 20 years old. And yet, we've never had a pandemic. So now you're addressing many things that, were, that was there. Also, um, reimagining, so today we're having our third working group. So the working group is already up and running. So that was a commitment that I made that I don't want to be at this crossroad again next year having the same conversation. Um, third, I have to call on my state partners, who also has a formula, foundational aid, that's also tied to working. And it doesn't look at my ENL students. It doesn't look at my students in foster care. It doesn't look at my students living in temporary housing. It doesn't look at a, a, a bunch of factors. So that's the conversation I'm having in terms of policy. Um, so FSF is being reimagined. We, we reimagined for New York City, and the fact that each New York City building is funded at two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, just the bare minimum to start, is unacceptable for me and the New York City children. So we must deliver better. We must do better. So that's what I'm calling on stakeholders, partners. This is a this is something we must do in partnership in order to have provide New York City students with the most with the most not even basic but a thriving public education. So from the state perspective, um, we are dealing, as you mentioned, with an old formula. Um, foundation A is old. And um, and we have in the department, I think um, I've done two and I'll probably do my third, God willing, this December when I do the budget hearings. and. It, uh, my, I call them the grueling because I'm on for four hours, um, you know, just 
quick questions and answers. And but it's a, it's it's an opportunity to really share with our legislators our best thinking. Uh, and being brutally honest, September the 30th, 2024, we're gonna hit a cliff, right? So people have to be um, prudent and really plan accordingly and plan so that you don't have recurring expenses based on on those dollars. But at the same time, those investments should be really focused on social emotional. Those investments should be really focused on really looking at it again. The term is learning loss. I, I consider it learning opportunities um, rather than market loss. And and while you know we could say that, you know some kids did learn, you know, did have losses as a result of but we have to create the opportunities, the investments, to really fill the gap. The funding issues, as most of you know, if you work uh, both in your space and lobbyists and what happens in Albany, we are constantly looking and challenging the issues of investing. If we talk about children are our most sacred and our most valuable, and everything else that we say, then we have to take and make the investments into our educational system. Otherwise, what it is, is if we're looking to invest in other things and not invest in what truly, truly matters, then it's revenue, right? So it's, it's a constant reminder now. At the same time, we also know that we have old buildings, we have old technology, we have so many investments that we have to make in order to get our kids ready for the things that we talked about, which is the reality of, right? So like any company, you have to use your most modern technology, your most modern thinking, your, all of that needs to be very much part of the investment in education. The, the, um, the monies that the federal, you know, are, we're specifically student focused, and we should be seeing those dollars, and we should be using those dollars truly, um, and be very intentional in what for what they were intended to be. Those dollars should not be hijacked, diverted, but rather to be used for the intention. And at the state level, that's exactly what we're doing when we're looking at district plans to make sure that what you said you were going to do is what you're doing and making sure that those investments are going where they belong and that is to the children of this state. Thanks. Yeah. Jeff, how did you listen? You know, what were you thinking and, and what are the perspectives that should come forward? Um, so there's these areas of our lives, there's actually many of them where what people who would actually do the work and know, know all sorts of things relative to the general public. So there's kind of a notional sense of the wisdom of the general public. But there's almost not a New Yorker who knows anything about the school funding formulas. So just like as Star Wars, that, that's not a value judgment at all, but like you kind of walk, I mean, in this room, I mean, there's thousands of New Yorkers, but there, many of them are in this room and they're in specialized. I mean, people do not walk around like, um, I'm concerned about my child's school and the funding formula generally. There's been some high profile fights in particular places between groups, they probably come out more. But by and large, people might say my school is underfunded, but like the formula and some of the governmental things, and that's just kind of part one. Which um, and so um, and there's generally, especially in New York City, the state um, there's an app, there is a decent appetite to fund instructional, what's going on in school buildings, teachers, students, learning. What you'll hear, and you hear the same thing in healthcare, is when you, and, and there's a group of voters, and it's significant, we'll just say, the solution to the problem is to fund it more. We ought to fund more, and wealthy kids go to very wealthy funded schools, or they come out in different ways, private, parochial, charters in some places. Um, lower income kids don't have the, that range of options, uh, and if we fund, so there's a lot of people in here in New York, especially funded more. That's the basis of the problem. There also is, if you when we hear it around healthcare too, that while the money in the classrooms is well spent, there's a lot of waste in between the funder and, and the classroom. 
that's not my judgment to make action. Someone who actually knows would say, you know what, we, we run a tight ship, we don't run a tight ship, there's a nature, but there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of education, bureaucracy, a lot of things that prevent the mind from going to the classroom. That is a perception. Um, I will also add, no one thinks their own child's school is overfunded, especially at the time <laughs> while, their child, while their child is in the school. Now, when their kids are done with school, and that, you know, and, and in places around the state, particularly the inner ring suburbs, where you see this a lot, where they vote, and where people's property taxes, they look, they start to vote against them, but it's much older people who vote against them. Younger people with kids in school say, you know what, it's a lot, but it's worth it because my kids are in school. So I think that that's a, we have to, um, and, and then the next thing I would say is that um, hugely important issue of equity, in my experience, for many people, read many white people, that the interest in equity ends at the beginning of their own notes, or our own notes. And so, as we kind of talk about, well, what's the stomach to actually do it? Not to talk about it, not to join, not to kind of publicly perform performative things, but to actually do it, which involves shifting resources, potentially those kinds of things, really, really politically, policy-wise different. I don't, I don't have the answer for it, but I see it over and over in all sorts of ways, including in the polling, you start to get, well, here are the remedies for those things that are the problems. And it's like, well, as long as it doesn't, you know, I want zero harm on me and, and my community, and so um, I think that's a big thing. Um, and the other thing um, I would say just on this is that it's also, um, there's a psychology, um, you know, in some areas where we don't, like, it, it, Schools aren't a consumer thing, but in some areas we don't like something, we go somewhere else. And schools that don't perform well do not automatically mean that parents say, we want the school out or I want my kids out. We have a deep psychological community connection to place, and I think especially in multi-generational families. This is just, it's a really, really difficult to say, you know what, the school is not working as it said. And mom or dad may have gone to the school, and grandma may have gone to the school, and maybe that was a different time. The demands on the school were less, or were different. Um, but, but I do think, kind of, when you get at, like, well, um, wouldn't in our system, you know, shouldn't there be a, if parents don't, if school's not doing so well, shouldn't they close, shouldn't there be a natural pressure? Um, it's been, I guess, surprising to me, maybe it shouldn't be surprising, but that. Um, in places where if you look at all the numbers or said, here's how the school is doing, not so great, but if we kind of say, well, um, you know, what should be done? There's generally a sense like we should improve the school, we should kind of fix it, um, and those kinds of things. So I do think that there is a, um, a we're, people are pretty, families are pretty dug in or connected to or engaged with the schools where they're children. Can I there's an element also in the conversation you had. Your visible dollars and your invisible dollars. Let's be real about that too. In poor communities, the invisible dollars are zero to none. In high-performing, high you know, suburban white communities, the invisible dollars, the invisible dollars are very present. Meaning contributions. Oh, you need a whatever. You know what? I work for IBM. I can get you twelve. You know, whatever. The invisible dollars are also present in the way that we support our children in one community, you support them because you can afford to pay for two years. You can support to, you know, pay and support a bond that will have the best uh, playing field for the athletes. You can afford to, in another community, that is not the case. So we talk about budgets and we talk about finance, but we only talk about finance in terms of formula that are state formula, and we talk about uh, budgets that are very much a part of formulas that are supposed to level the playing field in terms of equity, and guess what? If this district is getting a buck, and this one is getting a buck 50, so well, they're getting a, a, a buck 50, the needs in that community are such that a buck fifty doesn't get you where the kids are entering the race in the same place. So we are so dishonest. And then we want to compare. Did you ever hear people say, well, my kid is doing, you know, what about this district? We want to compare 
places and spaces that are, and as I started to say, the gap is so unbelievable, but we want to compare them. And to your point about the, the schools where the grandparents went to, whatever, we've decimated many of those because if, if you think about it, and this is no reflection on how I feel about certain, uh, I, I, I'm going to call it out, charters have a place in this society. But they also, when the children do not work out, where do they return them to? They return them get them back to the public setting. Number two, I often say to people, if this experimental drug is so good for everyone, then why don't I see them in certain districts? Why don't I go to the doctor and just say, I want them in my backyard. Come on, I want them. Look how good they are. They are performing a good, uh, as many people will say, support to a community that is struggling. But you're also dividing that community. You're also keeping some in one place and some in another. You're saving some, but you're leaving behind others. And all I'm saying, and that's why I want to go back to system. We've got to fix the system and the way we function. Not come up with tinkering and, and looking at ways that we come up with solutions. This is a complex problem that deserves a complex solution, not a simple solution. Thank you. Yeah, there's so much here. And, and again, every year this panel seems to go too fast. Like we get through like 10% of our questions and 10% of the things we want to pick these guys' brains on. Uh, but, you know, I'm also reaffirmed and, and also so grateful that it seems like they're the right people who are in leadership wrestling with these types of issues. So thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Joseph, I kind of want to leave the party word with you. Um, you know, I know you've been out this week with backpack campaigns and getting instructional supplies in the hands of kids, and that's magic. And you can either tell us about that, or I'm just kind of curious as we leave, just what's another story of just magic happening out there that's, that's right and good and that we all will put a tear in our eyes as we, as we go to the next session? Um, I, visit, I visit a lot of schools just like Dr. Boutique, learning about financial literacy. And I was like, oh, so what's the hottest stocks to buy? This is, this is the secret. They said Netflix, council member. So, Netflix, okay. <laughs> so that, that's what I saw. And most of them in college, um, they had a plan, the career path. They work inside their schools. They're a special school where the students get paid. They, they work, they learn, they write their own lesson plans. And they're leading the initiative. Um, the teacher is the facility, facilitator, and this is student-centered. And I was like, wow. And so many great things are happening in New York City public schools and they're not being told. So I think I told the chancellor that all the time. You're not selling New York City public schools. Start selling them. Start telling the wonderful stories of these amazing kids that come with challenges, but yet they rise to the occasion. So for that school, I salute them. Awesome nugget right there, and, uh, and thank you all for your incredible expertise. And so, yeah, we'll hand it over to our next presenter. Thank you, everybody. And then the pandemic kind of exacerbated everything. So, what kind of changes were, were generally underway? Yeah, so um, just to offer a quick context, New York State, the history of higher education in New York State really is one of the you know, deepest, historical, most diverse uh, histories in the country when it comes to higher education. You can go back to the 1700s and Alexander Hamilton, right, as a board of regent and its connection to, at the time, King's College, which became Columbia University. And you look at the structure of higher ed in New York, and we literally are one of the largest, most diverse in the country. Our public university system with SUNY and CUNY is, is by far the largest and most diverse. And, and we, got, we, we run the gamut from religious seminaries and academies to single purpose career schools, to our senior community and our independent and private colleges. And right away, we learned early on in the pandemic, um, was that when, when schools started to call back their international students, 
where, where it started to flare up first, and then all of a sudden had to, like our K-12 schools, had to actually shut down the campuses and quickly pivot to distance learning and online learning. And what was interesting about it was it was not as much of a shock to the system as we saw for our K-12 system. As you know, many things before the pandemic, where colleges were already engaged in a lot of very unique distance education, hybrid, uh, simulated uh, clinical experiences. And so while it wasn't as much of a shock to the system, it certainly was a sea change in how the partnerships with government agencies, with industry, with our healthcare partners who were out on the front lines of the pandemic, it all started to now say we've got to come together and figure out week to week and month to month how we do this. So one small example, uh, our, our schools and our pipeline of teachers, so our, our universities that train our teachers all of a sudden found themselves saying how are we going to place our student teachers into school districts, right? The school districts are shut down. We did not have these real flexible regulations or regulations that, that could deal with unique teaching in remote learning environment scenarios. So right away, through the magic of Zoom and WebEx and Teams, we had to meet on a weekly basis with a lot of our partners at the colleges, our educator preparation programs, our school districts, our industry partners, and we had to say, what do we need to do month to month, put in front of the regions to get us through this and make sure and we're able to keep our teacher pipeline going, keep our healthcare pipeline going with nursing, right? Do we need to graduate, we need to figure out a way to graduate our nurses maybe a little bit early and get them out into the field? And this started, you know, again, it started to cascade into this is a new way of trying to look at the triad of how we regulate higher education. And I mean triad by if there's autonomy of mission that's very different from one college to the next. And there's also a connection with state government, with, with resources that are being pumped into colleges and partnerships with our school districts for up to over $8 billion now in New York State with an investment with early college high school opportunity program initiatives, initiatives to really address a lot of the uh, issues that, that Chancellor was talking about and Commissioner earlier related to career technical education and making sure our students can get career and college ready and of course, the federal government with, with student loans and making sure that we're that, that they're there during the pandemic when colleges were trying to figure out how they're going to keep this enterprise going. So again, there were a lot of things going on uh, before with a lot of unique, you know, training, uh, distance ed, hybrid simulations, advanced labs at colleges. But this really, what really started to pick up pace um, was these partnerships between industry, our community-based organizations, our school districts, and, and now trying to figure out a way to pivot together to say, how are we really going to now, post-pandemic, you know, take advantage of a lot of the things that started to, you know, move in the right direction and approach higher ed in, 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 in ways that maybe we didn't think of before. And anyone feel free to jump in and do it quickly, because I'm going to try to hit all the points. Uh, anyone? No? Don? Uh, we, we, um, of course, the digital divide was exposed uh, during the pandemic because everybody went online. Uh, how much? How much did it expose about how bad it still is? And what are some of the solutions now we're going to be working on? Sure. Um, and, and just for context, um, you know, uh, NAV uh, showed the service industry partners to high school districts, and it's important on um, students across uh, the country, but in New York State, in the city. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, here we go. Um, but as it relates to the digital divide, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, the pandemic is a big concern. Added, added um, uh, spotlight on the fact that there is a digital divide. This is something I've been talking about for decades in the education, in terms of the lack of uh, equitable resources for students, especially students in our communities. Uh, so certainly, a lot of the pivoting um, had to be uh, had to be related to ensuring that we are providing students with the appropriate access to like partners and team who are uh, providing uh, technical support and resources to the underserved students um, as an organization, ensuring that uh, we are providing the opportunity to uh, mitigate some of those challenges for our students and for our districts as well. Uh, and that what that looked like for us is. You know, one was ensuring that our teachers and our educators had access to resources 
um, on, our, on our websites and our platforms. Um, initially, our resources were uh, allocated specifically for NAP academies, but certainly we need to make sure that you know, as teachers were transitioning to more and more learning and instruction and teaching for students, that we had to provide uh, access to those resources that were supporting our current and important and is there any chance uh, for you kids, uh, that because of the pandemic, you know, before it was not that it was just helpful, obviously having access to the internet and technology was almost necessary, but now it was really necessary because this is this was school. You're learning from home. So were there resources made available that all right, we really have to get these kids computers, high speed internet access, everything they need just to get into their classroom? Yeah, sure. I mean, certainly, again, um, in partnership with, with a lot of our national partners, um, in terms of being able to provide that. And then we're also thinking about the student experience, right? Um, when we're talking about, um, you know, career pathways and ensuring that students are in college and career ready and making that transition to post-secondary options. Um, and, uh, you know, for us specifically, you know, the world of work and the future work is shut down, right? And as we see now, things have evolved. Uh, tremendously in terms of how we approach work. And one of the things that we had to do as an organization is take it in terms of you know, our internship requirements. You know, what does that mean for our students when they can't be in office spaces and brick and mortar locations? Well, we were able to, uh, with the help of our partners, pivot to virtual internship opportunities. With virtual internship opportunities, again, ensuring that students' needs were met to be able to participate and really learn from the organizations and companies those yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, add. So, hello everyone. I, I'm Eric Dinowitz. I'm a council member. I chair the Higher Education Committee, but just for a little context, I taught in our public schools for 14 years. I taught um, high school students with uh, disabilities. Uh, so, you know, almost college age kids. And there is no doubt that when the pandemic began, the people shifted immediately online. That was a necessity. Uh, and a lot of us became a lot more fluent in Zoom and Google Teams and Microsoft Teams. Um, though I'm still astounded at how many people still don't mute themselves when they're like, yeah, you know what that looks like. Uh, but, um, but I also think it's important to take a deep breath and, you know, again, celebrate the, the work and, and the commitment companies that we to today do and have to our students, but also recognize that a lot of the challenges our students face are not academic. And any teacher here knows that when a, the kid comes in wearing the same pair of clothes, same you know, every single day for a week, um, when they lose, when they have unstable housing, or when they're just putting their head down during class, you know something else is up. When you're looking at that child on a Zoom screen, or when their camera is off, you do not have that same interaction. And this is something that uh, I, I've been touring the, the city colleges and community campuses. President after president have told me this story. Then when I ask about students with disabilities, how they're reaching out to students who may need 504 accommodations, um, they say, you know, we may not get a lot of people um, going to the Office of Students with Disabilities early on, but when a professor sees that that student is struggling, they'll just approach them after class, or the student will approach them quietly after class and talk about the accommodation. Those interactions do not happen when you when it's everything is virtual. And so we, uh, as a system, I think it's very important, we are very deliberate about what modules and what components we are doing virtually, um, and which components are in person. And the second important thing that we have to recognize in terms of all the resources at our fingertips. Um, I, I went to public school, and in 1983, uh, I went to the library in elementary school, and the librarian showed us, you know those very long drawers with the Dewey Decimal System? The card catalog. The card catalog. You're like 20-something. You don't know the card catalog. I have a very school library. In the so, we, so we learned... By middle school, and this was heartbreaking, by middle school, the, the librarian was using those card catalog things and using them as scrap paper to lead us to the computer that will show us uh, where to go. And by, and by college, 
We have free access to JSTOR. Everything was at our fingertips. And I think we celebrate that, and that is so important um, that our students have those resources. We spoke about it so much. We pivoted in March to, uh, to full virtual learning with my students. We, I was so fortunate to have websites like Khan Academy available. Um, but with that comes, I think, the, the darker aspect of the internet that we have not addressed. Uh, I had one lesson in my schooling uh, about differentiating between real articles and fake articles. And the article was about Velcro farms. And um, <laughs> Velcro farms aren't a thing. If that were, you know, but that was sort of the point of the lesson. And we are at a very uh, dangerous inflection point where so much of technology is at our fingertips and people from across the country and the world can connect in ways that we can and should be able to. But we are also at a time when conspiracy theories have, have taken hold. People don't believe in an election. It used to be kind of a joke, like, oh, we didn't land on the moon. Oh, you think the Earth is flat? Ha, ha, ha. But it's not funny when we're talking about excuse me, the integrity of our elections a significant portion of our population have enough doubts in them, um, and that information is able to be shared. So in conjunction with us expanding technology, <laughs> I, I, I speak to all three of my kids' classes and try to teach them how to differentiate fact and fiction, and these kids these days, they don't, they don't search, they don't seek out their own news. I, I tell these kids, you know, you're just on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and you're just passively accepting whatever news is thrown in your direction. And you could be hearing about something important from some guy you follow because you can balance ping pong ball instead. You know, that's not it. Anyway. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Um, and as I said in the opening, everybody here is really focused on the things that will create engaging content that is relevant to our students, removing barriers for all of our students, um, and more importantly, really breaking down silos so that institutions and agencies can work in a coordinated way. That sounds like common sense, but that is a very difficult thing to try to get done. Uh, but I want to get the politics out of the way so we can actually have an educational conversation. But politics is, of course, a part of education everywhere in this country, but especially here in New York City. So, Senator Lou, how are you today? <laughs> Michael, I, I, I don't know what you mean by politics. <laughs> politics and education. Uh, I always tell people, politics is when you have more than two people in the room. You're going to have politics. And you throw some money in there, part of the equation, you're going to have mega politics. And so by definition, education has to have politics in the mix because education is the by far the largest expenditure of state government in pretty much every state in this country. It is by far the largest expenditure in municipalities, certainly here in the city of New York. So you got more than two people in the room, and you got more than a few shekels in the room, and boom, it's explosive politics. And I would have it no other way, because politics is not a dirty word. Politics is when everybody gets a chance to weigh in, and at the end of the day, the compromise is the best result possible in the collective whole. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of politics in the budget, there's a lot of politics in how our schools are run all throughout the state, and certainly here in the city of New York. Lots of issues, you know, they have a, a, a mass mandate, mandate, some people are going to be upset, the people who are happy about that will not say a word. You try to take away the mass mandate, all of a sudden, all the people who were happy before, they're now upset. But all the people that were upset at you before, they don't say a word. It's like you never get protests from people who are happy. <laughs> but anyway, that's the nature of the beast. And so I'm really excited to see all of you, this incredible turnout. Thank you to City and State for putting this on again. They've been doing this annually. This is, without offense to any of the previous venues, the most beautiful venue they have had this conference so far. Give it up for City and State and for the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So we appreciate that opening, Senator Lou. So parents, educators, advocates first went to the federal government and fought for unprecedented amount of the money because of the challenges we were going to face in education. And thankfully, the federal government delivered on that money. Then state elected officials 
uh, we went to the parents and the advocates went to the state, and the state delivered uh, the high, highest amount of funding we've ever seen on public education. New York City schools are being faced with a budget cut. The Department of Education and Mayor saying it's not a budget cut, it's an enrollment thing. There's $5 billion in unallocated funding still that has to be spent in the next two years. Uh, we need your point of view on this as a state elected official, because I'll be frank with everyone, federal elected officials, state elected officials, uh, hearing from parents that, why are my schools being cut? And they're hearing, and, they, and then they get to respond, well, we didn't do it. And as a parent, that's not, they don't really want to hear that answer. They know that their child's in that school. And the other piece is the legislation on class size. So, all right, so. Easy um, one, go ahead. Yeah, of course. I, I know we're getting to the next 46 minutes. So, you got four to six minutes. <laughs> uh, first of all, the budget cuts to individual schools completely unnecessary and completely wrong in this day and age right now. And, Trying to get things back to normal when we're trying to encourage parents to return their kids to New York City public schools. This is the absolute worst time to cut budgets to individual schools. Now, I know that the city is saying that, well, it's because of enrollment declines. Well, if you read the fair student funding formula literally, yeah, maybe that could be justified. But the problem is that the fair student funding formula is broken in the first place. The city Council recognized this four years ago in 2018 when they passed a local law directing the city to relook the fair student funding formula. The city was supposed to do that. It started. It never finished. It's got to finish the job, fix this fair student funding formula. What's wrong with it? It still funds individual schools largely based on head counts and additional weights for each individual student. So naturally, if it's by student, when enrollment declines, you would assume that there will be a decline in the amount of money allocated to that school. But that the, the main flaw of the fair student funding formula is that not only does it not recognize the additional costs of providing sound basic education to, to kids, especially kids with special needs and special circumstances, but it simply does not recognize the fixed cost nature of school buildings and of individual classrooms. If enrollment is down 20% in a class, well, the costs of that class don't go down 20%. You still need the same teacher, you still need the same room, you still need the same light and heat. And so we need to fix that formula so that it recognizes the fixed cost nature of running classrooms, or at least a concept called STEM variable costs, which I think Julie Ma will know about. So we need to understand what the cost structure is of the schools and allocate the funds uh, realistically. And by the way, I'll mention that that fair student funding formula is what is used by the city to allocate state dollars. Many of you will know that, will remember that's called foundation aid. Well, the state never reduced foundation aid when enrollment went down. The state is still sending the same amount of foundation aid as scheduled, which is actually an increase for the last couple of years. So enrollment declines didn't reduce state dollars. So it makes no sense that the city would reduce dollars to the individual school. Now, the second point, which I have, I guess, only two minutes left to talk about, uh, and, and it won't take more than two minutes, because it's a very simple concept. Our classes are too large in New York City. There's too many kids. Attention to the kids. The kids are getting into service, and that is in large part why the courts of New York State ruled that kids were not getting a sound basic education. One of the primary causes, because classes in New York City were excessively large. That led to the court ruling that the state of New York was not providing kids with a sound basic education. It resulted in the governor and the legislature back in 2006 and 2007 coming up with a plan to greatly increase that foundation aid, that state funding for schools. Now, for many years, we didn't actually fulfill that promise until this coming April. For the last three years, we've been phasing it. Come April 2023, we will, we will have fully phased in that foundation aid. That means that the state will make good on its entire promise and mandate to provide a sound basic education for every kid in the state, especially in New York City. And we provide that funding, 
And part of that means that excessive class sizes have to be whittled down to normal class sizes or reasonably sized classes. And so we provided the funding for that, and we've also passed the bill nearly unanimously in both houses of the legislature that requires the city over the next five years to come in compliance with class size limitations. No more than 20 in grades kindergarten through third, no more than 22 kids with grades four through eight, and no more than 25 kids in high school classes. These are, these are limitations that I came up with. They are, they're not arbitrary limitations. These are limitations that currently the DOE claims is too costly, but guess who came up with these limitations in the first place? The DOE. Back in 2007, when they were arguing that they needed more money. They successfully argued that they needed more money. We are finally giving them the more money, and now they're saying that somehow they can't do it. It's time to dispense with the, dis the excuses. Get rid of the excessive class sizes, bring classes down to a reasonable size, and finally give our kids their sound basic education as mandated by the board. Any one of our, any other of our panelists want to jump in on either one of these? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, so the politics of the politics, and I will say uh, on Senator's little behalf that until the state actually supplied the funding, he would not support the bill. He said, we have to do our job before we can ask somebody else to do theirs. And he said, clearly now we have done our job, we have sent the money, they need to spend it where it's supposed to be spent, not outside of the classroom. So, thank you, Senator. All right, so politics is gone for now. We're good. Please, I just, I, I, as part of my work as an AAT vice president, I was just in a bunch of southern states, and the politics down there are really, really destructive to say the least. And then they wonder why they can't get teachers. So, we'll leave that to another day. All right, so, we all believe, as I said, we want to diversify our education, we want to move it to a better place. How do we get this done? You know, really, these are, there's frustration with silos, and we all have it in our own different ways. So, first thing I want to do is, let, normally we would start with what's going on in K-12. I'm going to do an opposite. Yes. Okay? I'm going to deploy you. Where do you think we should be going here? So, when we, so from a university perspective, from a higher education perspective, we have to be better connected. We talk about silos a lot, and we've heard the word partnerships used a dozen times at least today. But when we put that label on something and there's really no depth to the partnership, then we're not working together and we're not listening and learning from each other. So, from a university perspective, for really centuries, the ivory tower wanted to tell business and industry what it should be teaching students and that the, the folks in business and industry should accept the skills, knowledge, and expertise that the, that the universities deliver. It's changing, it's getting better, but we absolutely have to flip that. At Western Governors University, we were founded by 25 bipartisan governors, no more politics, I promise you. <laughs> bipartisan governors, because they wanted an institution that would prepare working adults to be able to enter into in-demand career fields. And they knew to do that, they had to talk to the leaders of the in-demand career fields and design programs that would work so that when they went to the job on day one, they were ready for success. So, so that's an example of, I think higher education is changing and starting to listen more and listen more effectively I just uh, chair the National Committee on Teacher Shortages and uh, Recruitment and Retainment. Um, one of the big issues that came out was spoke a lot of higher education people and everybody else is the education industry and its preparation of its teachers is by and large, most teachers, we, we did this across the country, we did hundreds, of, uh, thousands of surveys, we did focus groups, they feel that their preparation is not relevant to the work they're being asked to be to do. Yes, so, so educator preparation programs have not done the, and, and I'll own this for Western Heritage University, 
when we talk about what happened with the rapid pivot in March of 2020, we had not prepared our education graduates for distance technologies. Had we done it, they, we, in the pandemic was the first time we ever did a student teacher placement that was virtual. As an online university, a light bulb came on and I actually was the, the person that went to our teacher's college and I said, can we please do some virtual student teaching placements? And you would have thought that I had asked something that was evil. And they said, well, well okay, we'll make that happen. And they did make it happen. But if we are not preparing educators for using technology, technology is a tool. It is not a teacher. Technology is a tool that professional educators should be able to leverage effectively so that all learners can access that that learning experience as it makes sense for them. Social emotional learning. We need to be preparing our educators for trauma informed practices. We've heard today about all of the things that K-12 educators are dealing with in the classroom. We need to better prepare educators so that they can have the full scope of skills and expertise that they need from day one so that they can be like Rita Joseph. If you remember what she talked about today on the resources and the networking as a 22 year educator, she could do those things because she had that depth of experience and relationships from day one. Our, all educators need to be able to do that. Thank you. I appreciate that because this is something we've been banging our heads against all over the years. And we are seeing some movement, but I, I think if you brought up the pandemic, something that's here all the time now, but for us, the pandemic was, it was you know, it's a tragedy, but at the same time, it caused some of the, it caused the most experimentation I've ever seen in education at one period of time. There was a lot of things that did not work, but then there were things that did work. So how do we learn from that and move it forward? Because if we found things that worked that we never tried before, what are we going to say? Oh, we're trying to get past the pandemic, let's go back to the way it was. When we have actual experimentation that did work. So Trevor, I know you have uh, really looked at this quite a bit, so you want to jump in on this? Sure, and I, I, you know, something that, that unites a lot of us as people who care about education is that we're all a little bit jaded with how unsurprising educational data is. That it's grim and it never improves as fast as we want it to. And so each year, as I look at advanced placement results for New York City, for New York State, for the country, for the for the world, I'm never surprised. We see minimal progress, minimal gains in learning. But this year, for the first time, I was surprised. Uh, here in New York State, and the nation at large, we saw a massive recovery in a single year. Because in the fall 2020 academic year, widespread school closing, 78% of schools closed across the country, and the advanced placement outcomes were the worst they've ever been in 70 years of the AK program system. So, but then we see this year, and what did the data look like? Well, we see suddenly in New York, a 13% increase in black students taking AP exams in a single year. A 15% increase in Hispanic students. And then I think, well, what were they learning in what, what were their scores actually like? So I read further through the data and I say, oh my gosh, black students' scores of three or better, the score that qualifies them for college credit, jumped by 33% this year. How did that happen? A single year after the pandemic, and the scores jumped for black students more than I've ever seen in my 20 years in this job. So we have to ask ourselves the question, like, what was going on during this single past academic year that finally resulted in some educational change in AP scores here in New York State and the nation at large? Although I need to say it's stronger here, New York has recovered more quickly in, a in the learning indications measured by AP exams than the rest of the country has. So to answer your question directly, I, I think we see two things happening this past academic year that resulted in a surprising gain in AP scores for black students and Hispanic students, and to a lesser extent, students overall. And the first of them is really to give credit to New York City and New York State. There is a degree of support and commitment to equity here that we do not see in a lot of states. New York City has done an AP for all move to ensure that courses are available, much more so than in many urban areas. And New York State was among the first to step in when the federal government stops subsidizing low-income students and say, well, we're, we're going to do that ourselves. As a state, we care about our low-income students. We're going to replace what the federal government no longer does. But, but I think something maybe more interesting in, in the lens of experimentation is, for the first time, many AP courses have switched away from having one big high-stakes exam and have shifted to project-based learning. 
ABAP courses this past year and made this pivot towards project-based learning. And that may not be surprising to us, but for many years before this, the only students basically who were taking AP Computer Science were white and Asian boys. And if that goes on for too long, as a curriculum developer, you've got to look in the mirror and say, the fault has got to be with us to some degree, not with the students. So we partnered with the National Black Science Foundation and revamped AP Computer Science, changed the invitation to make it a course that's not about the syntax of an advanced programming language. I mean, how many of us, if we wanted to learn French, would say, I want the first class to be a French syntax class? Well, that's what AP Computer Science was for decades. And so that was an overhaul, and instead became a project-based learning class where each student is developing apps to solve problems for achieve opportunities in their own communities and household environments. And suddenly, black student participation takes off. Low-income students' participation takes off. Girls in STEM participation takes off. So that really sends a strong signal to us in the AP program that we need to migrate the remaining 30 AP courses to project-based learning. The new IPF program and studies class. Yes. Well, you know, I have to ask a question. I know I have people in the room at least thinking, did you lower the standards? Yeah, thank you for asking that. So that would be the obvious, like, did the score suddenly get better because the AP tests were just easier to hear after the pandemic? Because people certainly asked for that. The number of letters I received saying, well, you just cut some topics out of AP this year. But we cannot do that. We want students prepared to place ahead in college so you can't have a student not learn. So no, no, emphatically no. The AP exams are statistically equated. There was no change in difficulty, but the scores skyrocketed this year. The change was in student learning. So for years, we've talked about project-based learning. I'm a big advocate of career and technical education. And we always talk about project-based learning is more engaging and does all these other things. It's something educators have known, but educational institutions have been very reluctant to move towards because it's not their comfort zone. It's not what we're prepared to do. So how do we take this lesson and use it to move? And now I'll own the K-12 side and say most teachers our evaluation systems, everything we're being asked to do, how we're prepared, does not lend to this. So how do we move past that? I'm throwing it out. Well, I would say the things, when you think about the lessons learned over the last two years, the, the, some of the top ones that come to mind are one, that we threw out sacred cows in the program. We were a really to try new things and to use technology differently, to change up the way students learn, whatever it was. And the other is, it's an overuse of the partnership, but I think it was a recognition that no one entity could do things on their own. And so I will use Learning Labs as an example that were highly successful in partnering nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, UFT, DOE, parents, in thinking about what do our students need at this moment in time, how do we rethink learning, what we can do for our students. And that's an example of, again, saying we are willing to try something new, we are willing to recognize we can't do it by ourselves, and we see the impact of it. So I think if we can embrace, continue to embrace those two things outside of the crisis, that's at least a good thing. Yeah, and I can tell you, we, after the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, where we first had to get all the technology working for everybody, the next thing was thousands of teachers were being trained online, and they knew the only way to survive and to engage their students was project-based, because you can't do the regular instruction, which we would normally do, in a virtual environment. It just does not work whatsoever. So, uh, no, Michael, I want to add to that. I, I wanted to respond to the higher ed um, question, because I have like, some choice management for higher ed, but it's, it's well, you know, we moved away from, and this is just, it's like, you know, we, in the 80s, right? Again, prioritizing um, everybody must go to college. And we just about got rid of functional vocational education programs. I mean, there was a witch hunt that was in the national age. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. So the, the, so the shift that happened there continued for 30, 40 years. Chancellor said this morning, 30, 40 years of making the shift. So I think one of the things that happened. Um, in the, over the last two years, in that partnership and collaboration, is that young people began learning more about careers. And the schools began partnering with workforce development organizations, who were the experts um, on workforce development. And the reason I, I reacted a little bit to your statement and to your statement is because we asked teachers to do everything. 
I mean, we're all educators, right? You know, you might be an education expert in technology, you might be an education expert in medicine. I'm an, I'm an education expert in all this stuff, right? Um, I would not want someone to ask me to teach chemistry. I am not an education expert in chemistry. So we're always asking teachers to be everything, do everything. And I think it's important that we recognize, as, as a professor told me recently, I, I went to college to study business. So that asked me to teach what was about. It's not my specialty. And so I think there are places where teachers can become more educated about how what they're teaching aligns with the marketplace. But they're not the expert to teach that book, right? They, you know, they don't know the nuances of the market and how it's changing. They don't necessarily know the nuances of the requirements. And so what happened over the last two years, and we saw that. We, we worked on a project with Envisions uh, for public schools with the transfer schools. What we saw with those young people were that they were demanding to learn more about careers when they were online, right? So they do those um, uh, assessment tests that tells them Oh, you are going to be more, you know, inclined to be this kind of thing. And then they do the deep research into that, and then they talk to people at home. So I think it's important for us to recognize that the more you can connect, um, that's why when the chances work is why, you know, build a resume, the more you can connect for young people what they learn in school to what they can do after school, is the more likely that they might be interested. And the more you can connect that to a work based on the experience, or an internship experience, or a, you know, a job shopping experience, then it's the more likely they're able to see beyond just the walls of the school that they're in and to the world that they could be a part of when they leave. So I think that's a, a key element here, collaboration and partnerships. As long as it leads to a good outcome for the child in their future, we're okay with it. But the real piece that we understand about it is that it engages the child. As an educator in a classroom, if you cannot engage or form a relationship with that student, they're not going to learn. So anything that will help you do that is a major piece of this. This is more of a 6 through 12 right now. New York City is lucky, it has a large inventory of career and technical education. But when you talk about the workforce development side of it, that is it, it's a combination of engagement, but relevance for a student does change. Uh, a lot in relationship, and when they feel it's relevant to their life, they'll move. So there are, but we have to, we cannot, you know, put our heads in the sand. Workforce development, economic development, career tech ed, three separate pots of federal. I'm sure they're all waiting to break down their silos and share that money with each other. Okay, and we just have to put that on the table. If we really want to move in a direction, which I would agree to support, that we put an alignment in dealing with that industry and say, look, we will redo our curriculum every three years, but we also have to start using this in education in a different way, in a much more meaningful plan way, but that will require three very established silos to say, all right, we're willing to do things a lot different. What do we think the possibilities of that? Well, I mean, one thing I thought it would require, so, you know, in the um, in that three buckets you lay out, the, the workforce piece is they're not very active around federal policy, mm -hmm. right? So they are um, and oftentimes not very uh, aware of what some of those rules and laws are because they don't really, some of them don't really get those type of resources to work, right? Yeah. So in New York City, for example, um, workforce development is uh, heavily invested in um, through um, philanthropy, for example. And when you make talks about workforce organization, I say to you, well, I don't get federal money, so you know, I really don't need to spend my time figuring this out. But part of the challenge, and I know this when I want an organization working for opportunities on there tomorrow, it's, um, it's a registered um, state, state is only other thing. Um, it's, you know, their, their course is registered, state education form, approved certification. Most workforce development agencies aren't stated. I mean, they're approved by the ones and threes, right. but they're not state education approved. So that this, the stuff they teach really often is not aligned to what we need to happen in schools, right? Mm -hmm. So you need those curriculum from the public workforce development side to align with what, what school education requires, right? So that um, they can get credit for it. That's okay. not aligned. So you don't have the energy behind um, kind of 
the CTE kind of uh, where they would fit um, with the public order system. There's no way to be behind that. And so like, we can get them actively and get stated, and get stated to get rid of the really ridiculously high fees that agencies or nonprofits would have to pay to become a state certified. Uh, of course, they might be more interested in, in doing something about it. But right now, it's, very, it's a very expensive endeavor for a nonprofit to apply for a license to the state to okay. pay a fee every year and then to get the state to come in and audit your records every single year. It's pretty active. Yeah, paying someone to make sure you get audited every year yes. is probably not why I'm in the list. Anyone else want to have in on this? Because I do have to move to one topic quickly before we get to questions. Okay, one we have to cover is definitely what we did learn and how are we going to put together a real meaningful network around social social emotional development and support for schools. The idea that a teacher can take a 40 minute webinar and deal with children in crisis is obscene. That is what is happening. So everyone talks about it. Yeah, John, you know this. No matter what level, everybody talks about social emotional trauma and crisis. It's nice, everyone knows how to say those words. But there is not, we do not have the clinicians up until a couple of years ago. We really had no access in schools to a real clinician. That is just boggles my mind. And again, how do we get there? And what should we be looking at in terms of ways that help support children, but more importantly support the school? Because if the child's in crisis, which we have many more than we've ever had before, the school is not prepared to deal with that, it doesn't have the support. It takes up, it destroys a whole day of learning for a whole class, and it takes up all of this personnel where we should have a system in place. So, anyone want to jump in on this one? Because this is a tough one for all of us. I'll jump in. Careful. <laughs> I, mean, I think uh, what we said before that uh, we kind of rely on teachers to do everything. Yep. And when, when we're not sure what needs to be done, well, let the teacher do it. She or he should be able to handle it. And uh, it's just more and more and more piled up on the teachers. And this, uh, what's happened the last couple of years, the traumas, emotional learning, uh, all sorts of family issues and social crises. I mean, the teachers have had to deal with all of this with their students. And there's not been the training, there's not been the additional support. Uh, well, what I have seen in state and city government is more prioritization for other positions, such as counselors, such as uh, social workers in schools. We didn't have social workers. And yet, the problems that were kind of uh, relying on teachers to deal with without training is work that social workers actually need to do. So at least from a fiscal management perspective, we're starting to realize that more budgetary priority needs to be placed in schools uh, on functions that are important, but that we can't simply just assume teachers are capable of handling. And social I, workers and counselors being part of those. So I, I want to jump, and I agree with what you just said, but now I'm going to talk about the an effect you probably aren't thinking about. The minute we do that, that gets piled onto the education budget, right? And then you know what happens then. Oh, this is it. But you're asking schools to do all of this additional work that they have to do now. But at the same time, everybody complains about the size of the educational budget. So is there a way to fund it without making it part of the educational budget? I guess we'll create a separate line. <laughs> Not necessarily for money, just a separate line. No, it's going to be a problem that right away. Because again, we're back to politics. Oh, we spend now what we're spending on education. Yes, but the school now has become your mental health clinic. So you're, it's now doing the service that is needed. So why should it be then the school is spend, spending more money on education? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, I dare say, Many people realize that the education budget is not just for what traditionally would be viewed as school education itself. For example, the education budget pays for nurses and some dental and vision care in some schools. Not all. No, I, said, I was careful to say no. in some schools. 
I'll go further. In a few schools, <laughs> school school budget takes care of. I mean, a huge, unbelievably large part of the education budget goes for transportation, and that used to be under the Department of Transportation. It's now all under the Department of Education. Uh, you know, uh, an important aspect of education: learning in a safe environment, and public safety. That is also now part of the education budget. So what is now called the education budget, you're absolutely right, Michael, it includes a lot of things that people would not necessarily assume to be educational functions. But that's not a reason to stop funding the things that are absolutely necessary. Whether you want to call it as part of the education budget or something else, the funding is necessary. Okay. I, I, well, somebody wants to answer this question because it's really right into it. Instead of asking teachers to stretch themselves thin, can we hire trained professionals inside of schools to specialize in specific areas such as mental health or career advice? So what happens is if there were a separate line, if there were a separate line that was dedicated to mental health, for example, would you constrain it so that the people that are hired to be social workers and counselors are actually only doing that work? I know that counselors end up doing scheduling. I know that social workers end up doing testing. So while you have social workers and counselors in schools, their time is not being spent on doing what could most benefit students that really need that extra support. Good point. Can I just put a plug in for the partners to education and partners to school too? Like the one. No, 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 no. I, I appreciate it. And this is not about not not having adequate funding, but there are resources in partners that are infusing that SEL mental health perspective into things. It is a matter of resources. It is a matter of access and understanding that there's a continuum where kids are in different places. And they also think it's a matter of progression, recognizing that kids. We'll need things at different times, right? So it might be on workforce development at some point, it might be on college training at another, it might be on mental health. And so using those other nonprofit and educational partners that, that sometimes have expertise, certainly are working in partnership with schools to understand what are those needs and how can they be included in the other platforms that are available, whether it's after school or the best for mental health. Is a resource as well. If, if the, if I could talk about the Department of Ed would have to change some of its policies, but it, it is something that we thought about a lot, like having each school district to have a cadre of different professionals that you know need that they only go to the schools when they're needed at that time and only work on those things. Because if you just put someone inside of school, sooner or later they'll be programming, they'll be <laughs> they'll be testing people. It's just going to happen. So. We, we already have some of that, right? So the transfer schools, right? Um, we have 55 of those, I think, or something. That's the next question. Oh, um, transfer schools, okay. We have 55 of those schools, right? Those schools are built with uh, nonprofit And if you're like SEO family services, you have you know, mental health counseling, right? And you have child care. So when you're a full service agency and you partner with a school, that school then gave access to the service that we have. And so I think that looking at those models and looking at the ones that that have worked well might be a way to really more building on a larger scale approach to the recipe to all that. How many schools do we have? Five hundred schools. Um sixteen hundred schools. And fifty five of them have are built and designed to have um, uh, socio emotional support. Nonprofit working with nonprofits so they can focus on academics and the part of this focus on the socio emotional health and well being of the young person. And so everyone is doing their job and they kind of talk to each other and come up with a plan for this young person. So I think that the opportunity is there, there to do that. Yes, it's going to be an issue of resources. But you know, I always say that you know, in New York City, we have a big private market yep. and we have a very robust philanthropic investment market in New York City. Those are some of the partners that we should be talking to about helping us to support some of these additional services um, in partnership for our young people. I mean, let's be honest, government can't do everything. Right. Just the same way teachers can't do everything. And so we have to find ways to partners with the others who have the expertise. I like to say, you know, sometimes you're looking for a market and you have the money, 
Well, they must have known Rob was looking for a market. They got the money. They need the students. And so you know, we can really begin to align with those pieces together. We might be able to get us some of the challenges that we're having. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the transfer. Well, no, I got to ask you a question. Oh, yeah, transfer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Considering that transfer schools, when served overage and undercredited students, are often underfunded and underserved, how can we better serve the needs of the transfer students? So I had a question this morning that I didn't get to ask. You got a mic. Well, I was back, I was back there. But I wonder how many of the transfer schools are going to be included in the new when you work at the, the chancellor um, this morning, because we, uh, uh, they, 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 that answer has not been given. Uh, I told every chancellor that I've worked with, I've been very clear with them. I said everyone starts with K to eight, then looks at high schools, and then a couple years later we'll get down to District Seventy Five and the transfer to District Seventy Nine. The smartest thing you could do is start at District Seventy Five and District Seventy Nine, because in the end. That's the way. That is the make or break for a school system in terms of its success. If not, it's always going to be an afterthought, and it will, in terms of accountability, it will always pull down the school system if you're not putting it up. For it. But I mean, can say this: not a single chancellor has ever listened to that. I look at the data for those schools. Graduation rate goes from twenty-three percent to sixty-seven percent. Really, you know that. It's going to work like a business in the decision sector. They might be closed down, right? In the case of those results. So I think it's important for us to really begin to focus on um, where we're having the most problems. You know, we'd like to start with well, where we're having the least problems, do you think, right? Uh, where we're having the most problems, where we're having so many black and brown kids are in these different states who are now connected to career opportunities. Who, who got there because of behavioral issues, academic issues. They are actually the kids, I mean, we can talk about which stuff. They're actually the kids that, you know, are, might need the vocational skills right now, right? And those skills should be in the schools. It shouldn't be happening after they leave school when they didn't get a high school diploma and then they get into my states, right? We're the workforce development field. We get the 30% of the people that the child said didn't go to college and they don't know what happens to them, we get that. We get the people that go to the community college, you know, that company showed uh, only 18,000 completed. The rest of those people, when they're not working, they come to our sector, right? So we have a sector that really focuses on this large group of people that the system has failed, right? And this, this, this is our sector does not have the type of resources that K-12 have. We just do not. And so one of the things that we've been prioritizing the last few years Really focus on partnering with schools, really try to influence some behavioral change in K 12 so that more young people, when they leave, will lead to exactly what the Chancellor said this morning. I love that he said, the value of the other legacy, these two things will be, be those. The thing is, what is this career connected piece? And I really like that because if that works, then our sector will have inspiration. We might be able to do some other things that we'd like to do that we can't because we're dealing with systems failure that pushes all these people in our space. Where there's the least amount of money to the point I made earlier, a lot of our nonprofits don't get federal funding, so they're not in the pool to work for those resources. So I think that the transfer schools, we would recommend, we work with new visions the last um, few years, and this is a function, you have to spot that, <laughs> is that these schools should be partnered with um, our workforce development nonprofits who are training, providing skills training, to that other population successfully. Um, and that the one thing that the schools should do is that the, the DOE needs some kind of validation mechanism to make sure that when a nonprofit that offers a training program shows up to a school, that their curriculum has been verified and that they should be uh, teaching the kids in the school. And they, that many of them doesn't exist. So, what I, I think I'm hearing is that we have a lot of work to do there, uh, but there is a clear common pathway to choose your common sense that should jump in. All right, you know this one. Back to politics. <laughs> <laughs> How will our already local crowded schools create smaller classes? What support will they receive, and how can we push and support together with more project-based learning? We're all looking at it. 
the legislation that has been passed on the United States on houses has provisions for this question for open. And the more important piece here, it, it gives a school uh, time waivers, different things, but never tell kids not to go into school. But the important piece in the legislation actually makes it the responsibility and mandates that the Department of Ed, when they have an overcrowded condition, must put forth a plan to be approved in terms of creating more space for that school. So I know some of the, you in here have probably done this. I've been out on the streets many times with parents protesting for years just to get a single school built. The process for getting a school sited and built in New York City has been broken for decades. Nobody argues that. But nobody's putting forth the process that says how we're going to do it. This legislation actually says, listen, Department of Ed, if you have a school with high utilization of students, you have to have a plan to ensure you can keep those sizes down. That means you have to be building annexes and looking for new space for those buildings. Go ahead. Agree, and those are provision and space issues that sometimes take time. Right? Yes, we do. Need it, and we have an urgent need. So I'm thinking we are in the most tech savvy, I'll say it, outside of California, the most tech savvy city. We are the most tech savvy city. We have all this intellect around space usage. Kids have to do community service. We're talking about workforce development and providing internships. There's an algorithm that Figure out where the school is the most crowded. Yeah. How many of those kids can be doing community service over here, working in partners with other organizations? Like it's not you could do it fairly quickly with the right technology, and then at least in the short term. Yeah, it's not okay. yeah, and, and I'll just add very briefly, Michael, if I may. It's the technology is there. Absolutely agree with Sharon. But even before the technology, there needs to be a will. Exactly. At the Department of Education, we've got a lot of people there, and you know, in partnership with other nonprofits, corporations, business, everybody, everybody has to yeah. Yeah. But we also need to grow the talent pipeline. You we'll get the rooms so you can have fewer students in that classroom, but you have to have the professional that's leading the teaching and learning experience therein. And we had this question earlier today: How do we? I don't want to use the term. How do we really lift up the profession? How do we make it known that being a professional educator is a laudable profession that bright, motivated, passionate people should move into? Because when we have all of these kinds of discussions about the real problems that we have, and, and if, if you're 19, 20 years old, you're not going to say, oh, that's a path I want to go down. So we have to figure this out, or else we're not going to have the talent that we need to make good class sizes. It might solve some of that if we pay more money. But I did watch news all week, all over this, all over the country. The national news was every, every beautiful announcement that people love on all the different stations talking about how horrible it is that we do not pay our teachers. <laughs> yeah, try me. Well, I was just going to add some more politics here, which is just not appropriate. I'm trying to get power right, so we can be one more person to try me. I don't want to touch the teacher pay. I just agree with Mark. And I think it's completely unfair to clap for that. That's why I give you a roll. I I do have. I do think we have solid evidence that there's a class size one for the teachers that is actually well. I think that the addition to pay they should not be able to produce longevity in the classroom. They should be spread out to a greater range of parents. I don't think I'm going to do that. Yes, I agree. Yeah, that was part of the report that was produced. It, uh, lowering the class size and bringing the joy back to teaching. Because I will tell you, my first experience in life was not as a teacher. I was uh, in construction for a long period of time, and I went into teaching just quickly because my mother made me do it. Um, she said, you know, you went to school, you had that teaching license, why don't you just try it? And I thought I was going to do it for a year. And this is what the joy of teaching is, you get caught into it. And that's why you don't hear teachers say my students. We try to say that, but we all just start saying it to my kids. And those little interactions are the thing that make you keep going back every day, no matter how tough it is. But what I hear from this panel today is the politics and education are always going to be there, but we want to create policies and practices that actually are driving money to the children. 
to the schools and to the programs that are going to make a difference. And we want to we want to start looking at common sense ways to bring all of that good energy into a school building and change the lives of the children of the city. So I want to thank you all for taking part in this conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, thank you. So without further ado, here are the panelists who are going to help us tackle some of those questions. Um, all the way to the left, we have um, David Adams, who is the CEO of Urban Assembly, which supports 23 New York City public schools. Um, he's also an expert on social emotional learning, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to have him. And I just also want to give a special thanks to David for joining the panel literally like 15 minutes ago during lunch. We had an educator who had to drop out at the last minute. Um, so thank you so much for joining. You're we have an um, assembly member, um, Todd Abinanti, um, who's the chairman of the Committee for People with Disabilities. I guess I should have started by introducing myself. I'm Alex Zimmerman. I'm uh, an education reporter at Chalk Meet New York. Hey, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> um, to my right, we have assembly member, um, Nader Syed, um, who's the chairman of the Subcommittee on Students with Special Needs. Um, to his right, we have Dr. Erica Lynn Smith, the Director of School Mental Health Programs, which is a joint program between the Education Department and the Department of Health, um, of health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and finally, we have uh, Reina Petroni, the Vice President of Community-Based and Education Strategies at New York Government. Um, so I thought I would start just by asking what might seem like an obvious and dumb question to some of you, but um, I always find asking dumb questions as a reporter often you know, best answers. Um, mental health can sometimes feel really hard to define, and there's a lot of jargon around it. Um, so, so what do we mean when we're talking about mental health, and how is that different from what we mean by social emotional learning? Um, and Eric, I thought I might start with you, Dan, for that. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, I appreciate it. I think that's a really important distinction, and um, I'd be curious to hear from you. Assembly as well, um, and social emotional learning and mental health can oftentimes be confusing, but they're just two different things. Um, very closely related. Um, mental health, when I talk about mental health, when I talk about mental health, I talk about diagnoses, I talk about clinical disorders. And then there's a spectrum of everything in between. I think in what social emotional learning allows us to do. In my field, it's social emotional development. The learning piece is about the skills. And the skills themselves are vitally important to providing protective factors for children, both in general, everybody can benefit, but also for those kids that are at risk for developing a mental health disorder. And that's why they're so closely intertwined. Great. I'm David, let me know if you want to weigh up. Yeah, thank you. Um, she said it really nicely. Um, so I think we talk about social emotional learning is really the process by which students develop these competencies, right? Um, mental health can be the state of being, right? How is your mental health? Uh, but the social emotional learning is that process of either school acquisition, uh, social emotional development, the context in which that happens, what happens. I um, mean, schools, homes, communities, those are all the places in which students and even adults learn the way they're supposed to be successful. Um, so I want to, since we have some folks here who are knowledgeable about you know, schools and who are part of schools, great, I thought I would direct this question to you, um, which is sort of like how are our mental health challenges manifesting in school right now, and what you're seeing in the schools that you all partner with. Um, I can just say in some of my own reporting, um, I see some evidence that students are well withdrawn, we know that chronic health education is higher, um, we've heard some anecdotes about students who are just like struggling to get out of bed and um, come to school. Um, and so I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of like how all of this is impacting um, schools. That's a good question, Alex. I think, I mean, the past year and a half now, we can say two years, because that has been sort of like the new normal state for everyone, um, has been challenging for students, for kids, and families, and for communities. We've seen um, their mental health needs and support even higher since the pandemic because students thrive by interpersonal relationship. With the isolation that they had to face in the pandemic, it has been tough not only on the student, but also on the families, to be able to adapt and adjust to those different circumstances. Um, similar to what you said, Alex, in the school, um, the New York County, where 20 different schools with co-located schools throughout New York City, 
providing school based mental health services and the tiered services. So, we provide targeted services, selective, and universal, the school wide initiative around how to support not only the parent, the teacher, but also the school leadership. We've seen students uh, feeling depressed, um, and we've also seen students who are fully isolated in the sense that they're not even manifesting any type of behavior. And those are the students we're most concerned about, and we work with the school leadership and the teacher, the guidance counseling team, what we call the school support team, the parent coordinator, to really identify the students who are at risk and get them in non-inquisitive behaviors. Um, we see the, uh, the behaviors around not feeling comfortable to come, coming back to school and reintegrating to the school system. Not knowing how to really form an uh, interpersonal relationship, having been away in, in that virtual context of Zoom uh, for so long, and having to really relearn those skills and how to best do that. I want to bring our two um, state lawmakers into the discussion a little bit here. Um, we know that also that students with disabilities have been particularly hard hit. We know that lots of you know related services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, were were really difficult and not impossible to deliver um, during long stretches of the pandemic. Um, so I'm sort of curious, like from your perspective in Albany, um, like are there legislative steps you plan to take this year that would you know, sort of help address some of those gaps? I mean, sort of generally speaking, what's on your agenda in Albany right now as it pertains to Yeah, don't worry. All right, first of all, thank you for uh, sending up this, uh, this forum and inviting us. Um, I am uh, chair of the Committee on People with Disabilities, but I'm also the father of a 22-year-old young man um, who uh, has autism. And so he left school just as the pandemic uh, one of the things that you did do, recognizing that so many students with disabilities uh, were not able to get the IEP services, the individual education plan services that they need, was passed legislation, we've done it three times now, requiring, in effect, that the schools give compensatory services that were missed during the uh, I have seen that some kids with disabilities thrive during the pandemic. They don't do well in classrooms with lots of interactions and lots of distractions. Most of them don't do well in a period. They can't do it themselves. You're talking about that broad middle group. Maybe they're uh, nonverbal, uh, but they, they just don't have the ability. And so somebody's got to be home with them, in effect, acting as their teacher. When they're interacting with your teacher on the computer. And of course, they can't get physical therapy, they can't get occupational therapy, and they can't get internship program to help them. So we tried to deal with one group of those. Those are the ones who were aging out, who were 21 while they were out of school, because the schools were saying, I don't care what the federal law says, the federal law may say that you've got an obligation to give them compensatory educational services. New York State law says 21 is the is the limit. So we and needed the 21. And he said, you know, age is not important now, you've got to give them compensatory <coughs> services. So we did that three times, three years in a row, and I think by and large that has helped. It hasn't helped those who are younger than 21. Those parents now back where they were before, once a year, when they go into their CSE meetings, they, are, uh, uh, they need to argue for those additional services. And of course, they're getting pushed back from the schools that say we can't afford it, we don't have the teachers, we can't provide those compensatory services. But parents have that right every year, and they haven't lost that right. So we've got to look at how do we strengthen the rights of the parents, and how do we educate the parents so that they understand that this is their right to demand for their child. We need to have more supplementary services. I'm more familiar with the suburbs, not New York City. I'm speaking with some people here today, I understand it's a real problem. How do you get parents educated enough? And how do you get them motivated enough to be the advocate for their child, and for their child, for their children? And how do we get support services? Right? They have a place to call and say, I need somebody at this meeting to help me. I need an advocate. I need, I need to be educated. I need my, my, my child somehow evaluated so that I, when I go into that CSE meeting, I can say to the school, no, you're wrong. Here's what the experts say my child needs, and I've got a right to get it. Sure, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, although I, I appear today as an assembly member, you know, 
I had a 49-year career in education as a teacher, a principal for some 30 years, as a president of the Board of Education, and involved with the Big Five. So, looking at this largely as an educator slash government representative, I look at the big picture, and I recognize that the biggest impact on whether it's mental health, special ed students, is the lack of proper funding for support services. And as an educator turned public official, my goal of going to Albany was to truly focus on resolving or trying to make that better. And the first thing we did, we started tackling the foundation aid and made sure the state restored and gave predominantly urban school districts with large special ed populations and so forth, and English language learners, the funds they need. As an educator, I know that when it comes to budgeting and there's a lack of funding, the first thing that goes and gets cuts are things like sports and music and art and library and more important, special education and support services. So when you see cuts that dip so deep into support services where and the source of all these issues goes back to a lack of proper support services that are impacted by funding. So this forum that really includes educators and decision makers and government officials and public officials and civic leaders is really an opportunity to continue to focus on making sure representatives, whether in Albany or local government in the city or elsewhere, or federal, recognize the importance of proper funding. And I think this year, the Assembly and the Senate has done a number of initiatives to assure funding for mental illness, funding for support services, and more important, revenues, avenues, to make sure that the funds are there to support these programs. I would ask a question. I think this, anyone on the panel can um, answer this, but maybe I'll start with um, Erica. Um, you know, we know just there's been enormous depth of challenges over the past three years. Um, and so I'm wondering, in, in terms of you know, mental health or social emotional learning, like, what do you think schools should be doing differently this coming school year? I think that's a great question. I mean, a lot of, um, and, and Ray and I are sort of hearing this firsthand being, you know, in the schools. What we're hearing from people on the ground in the schools is there's a lot of symptoms like sadness, a lot of uh, isolation, despair, anxiety. I think the thing to consider, and, and I certainly don't want to um, ignore or make light of those symptoms, I think what is really important is to consider having been locked behind doors for the last 18 months, two, you know, two years with just your family, I would be concerned about the children who didn't so show those kinds of symptoms. I think what I'm concerned about is the adults in the space who are working with those kids to get over into the next space that they need to be in, which is to um, be kids, right? And feel like, now I don't want to say normal, say typical, have a typical experience. Um, a lot of the conversations I've had with kids has really been about what's going on with these adults who are expecting me to act like it's normal. And if I'm not stupid, this isn't normal. <laughs> you know, and that's been the expectation, and I think that's something I'm saying. David or Ray, anyone that happened on Yeah, I'd love to um, follow up on it. I think, I think if you look at, when we talk about social and emotional development, um, we're really talking about what are effective developmental pathways for kids, and what's right for kids, right? Um, how often does a student resolve conflict effectively? How often uh, does a student establish effective relationships with their peers? Um, how do they attract positive And I think uh, there is a tendency to overemphasize, uh, notwithstanding some of the challenges of the pandemic, um, some of the symptomology that students are bringing and saying, you know, the world is coming to an end. Um, but we do know, based on the literature, that most folks are affected by coping with difficult situations if they're doing it with strong support systems 
and using effective social emotional skills. Right? So at the end of the day, uh, we need to continue to invest in students learning and displaying these social emotional skills. Because we can't control them. Uh, we can't control the pandemic, we can't control parents and, and their contacts. But we can control uh, students' reaction to these things when we uh, empower them with these kinds of skills and supportive environments. Can I just say thank you for saying that? Because I think that's a message that we sometimes forget that we can't prevent that. What we can do is help students and children get to the other side of it. Um, you know, the symptomology that people are seeing, um, again, it's normal to respond in these ways. Um, protective factors, and that, I, I will just close with this to say, this is research fact. Like, this is not, not just the opinion of Eric Smith or <laughs> David or, or Alex or Raina or anybody else. There is a one-to-one -one relationship to protective factors that can mitigate the any experience of a risk factor. And so that's why social emotional development and skills and, and um, curricula are so important in the school system. And I just make a comment. It seems to me what my colleagues here are saying is that we're not looking at the long-term impacts of COVID on the school system. Everybody talks about it from the medical point. But has it changed the world? And what what do we want to get back to? If we want to go back, or we want to go to something new? But let's take a look and see what actually the impacts are. And I can see just with my son and some kids that you know the world is different for them, and it's very different than it was when they left. Uh, and I this is this is a group of, of young people who have uh, developmental disability. But I have to believe that it's the same impacts on, on typical kids, but even more so on kids who are prone to having a mental illness problem in the first place. So that we really need to look at the whole system and say, what are the long-term impacts? And how do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, just to add, I think in many of the schools that we work with, I think a lot of focus and a lot of pride is put on what are the resources for students? What we find helpful in helping the school get ready for the entry or start of the school year is really thinking about what are the resources we need also for the workforce. We know some teachers, parent coordinators, school principal, their parents too. So they probably have a lot of things that they're facing with their own kids at home or their own community or their own neighborhood. So we're really targeted around workforce um, training opportunity or processing session so that it's not only focused with students who, um, whether it's around depression, um, any type of like social emotional skill, but also what type of resource the educators need in order to best support um, the students as they're being treated. And same for parents, we do a lot of good workshop opportunity for parents in order to support with identifying what are the signs of mental health concern? What are the signs that we may not be considering that can help support kids to be successful around thinking about their education here, but also in the future for work and also for career opportunity? I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it connects to what David was saying a little bit about like what role schools and, and staff can play in sort of making schools feel like welcoming places. Um, and I know this is something that you, that you when we were talking about this a little bit in the prep session that you were interested in raising. So I, I do want to kind of throw it back at you to see if we can like get some traction on some answers to that might be. Because I know on the panel before this one, we were we heard from the teachers union president saying like a 40 minute training on trauma informed practices or whatever isn't going to cut it. So what would cut it? I mean, what 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 support do teachers need? Like what would be helpful for staff in terms of like responding to students? So can I? And I, I want to talk to you after. Um, I would. I do want to put it out there. Um, I, I think teachers are asked to do a lot of things. They're the ones who are with the kids, sometimes longer than the parents are throughout the day. I was a preschool teacher for a little while, so I know what hard work it is. <laughs> um, but what I would say is that educators are great at teaching skills. They teach math, they teach chemistry, they teach science. So the skills base, I don't think, is outside the scope of what teachers can do. But I don't feel it's fair to ask teachers to be clinicians. I'm a clinician. I'm not a teacher. I'm not an education expert. But there are things that just adults can do that are not clinical. They're skills-based. They're teachable. And I think with the support, so a lot of the work that 
my program does is to help schools integrate the social emotional curriculums that have been prominent in New York City schools for quite some time with the professionals like Mayor Traveling, who have on site staff to be able to support when it's identified that a child needs more support and it's more than just adult child interaction or support when it becomes a mental health need or concern. Alex can sure. tap on uh, what Eric is saying. Um, I think she's used the word protective factors, and we can break this down. Um, the most important protective factor for any young person is a high quality relationship with an adult. Um, and so we talk about the role teachers play in the classroom, and any adults, the quality of interactions that students have with those adults can be the determining factor if something comes from a sadness to depression to present uh, an issue. So we have skills. And there is 100% right, right? We can teach skills, right? We can teach skills like identifying our emotions, conflict resolution. We can teach skills like setting goals and, and having those responsibilities. And every adult, and this is why when we talk about adult mental health and adult uh, social emotional development is important. Every adult can be a protective factor if their quality of relationships are such that students can attach them and, and help them to move into different spaces. So social support is an um, and that's what we ask of our teachers. I know it's not because teachers are working from all the other things. Um, but I don't think it's beyond the scope of the teacher to have a supportive and caring relationship to another person. And that is the most important thing for social media development. I agree with what all my colleagues have said so far. I just want to add another twist to this. You're dealing with kids with disabilities, you're dealing with another level, especially if you're dealing with kids who can't talk. And you don't know if their behaviors are the result of a change in their um, their disability, or if it's a result of mental depression, or a mental illness, or the result of the pandemic and the isolation, or whatever. Uh, because many of the kids with disabilities, and I'm not a clinician, but from what I understand, many of them get comfortable in a certain space and they change that space without the transition. They have great difficulty adapting to the new environment. And so you don't know here whether this is just the, the typical autism problem or whether it's a mental health problem that's going on. I just can add on the social development that's crucial uh, we got to recognize that we, all of us know there was a tremendous loss of not only learning time, but the social interactions due to the pandemic. And years ago, it was just a few of our schools and districts that had summer programs and after school programs. And with the pandemic, many of us have turned to the right course. And, and the message today is to motivate, to really try to bring back the lost academics, but more important, the social skills that were lost for many of our children through summer school and after school initiatives. And uh, this is something that, again, relates to either not having proper funding or lack of support. But this is really, in my opinion, a necessity that when we budget and we plan, it should be not just for a few children, but because of our lessons we've learned, that should be an ongoing enhancement to really catch up and reinforce, in my opinion, for all children. And I gotta say, the last year going around to many summer programs and after school, the enrollment is much higher than it was years ago. So I've seen this before, and I've seen it with Hurricane Sandy, and I see it. So if we can do anything differently, I would like to learn from how we sort of infused all of these resources into the city, and then we pulled them back because we thought this will never happen again. And so I think the reality is, is that the best de defense is prevention, and we need to sustain that, and there needs to be an investment in that. It's very hard to predict with data and you know, support it with statistics, for something if it doesn't happen. So it's much easier to say there's a rise in this because you can see it. Prevention is so important and so difficult to justify because you're preventing something from happening. And I just hope that that's how we can shift 
how we address that. From the policy point of view, to pick up on that, I think the point you're making is that day in and day out there's a crisis somewhere. And we need this remedial system in place all over the time. It's doing prevention, but who knows when there's going to be gun violence that these kids are going to see, or there's going to be a storm, or there's going to be a, a breakout of something. So every day there's another challenge for these young people. And the means of communication have so changed over the years that they're exposed to this at a very young age, whether they're on TikTok or on whatever, whatever social media they're on, they're no longer isolated. They're being exposed to something all the time. And, and the system that is put in place is remedial it really needs to be part of the ongoing, everyday activity. Alex, if I could just for one second. Sure. Me and Eric will really bad at that. Um, <laughs> and the key word prevention, and I want to nuance that to the emotion, right? We are promoting confidence and adaptability for young people. But I can say preventing that behavior. We are lifting up our people to display the kinds of things that we need them to display and be successful citizens. So I'd like to highlight like one really specific thing that changed last year in New York City public schools related to some of the things we're talking about, and that's every single, I believe every single student was screened for social emotional competencies, um, which is a, a pretty significant shift. Um, and I know that Urban Assembly was sort of an early adopter of that. So I'm wondering if you can tell us just a little bit about like why you think that's important. And like, you know, again, sort of like social emotional assessment is sort of like a jargony thing to say, but like if you could help us understand like how that's supposed to inform the classroom and classroom practice. So. Yeah, that's a great great question. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna kind of a little bit of merit here. Um, the, there's an idea uh, that we have to wait for bad things to happen to help people in a way that something bad happens and so we bring resources to bear on the student social emotional development. Um, in fact, we want every student to graduate. New York City school systems, college, career, community, right? Ready to operate, ready to fuel themselves, problems, ready to go out to college, ready to do their careers. And so the first step to that is having clarity as to what it means to be social emotionally competent. Eric had mentioned this. Uh, we could see incidents of depression go up, right? Do we see uh, incidents of self awareness? Do we see students resolving conflicts and, and doing good jobs and managing these things? We don't. Uh, somebody earlier said, if you need please, please, right? We're very sensitive to bad things, but there are kids every single day who go through difficult systems and circumstances to demonstrate resilience in order to, to be successful. So the work around uh, the SEO screener and SRNYC is about elevating these social emotional competence, the self-management, social awareness, working in groups. We talked about college and career events, making sure students know how to work in groups and communicate with that work. And so before this work, uh, we were seeing different things happening in New York. The language in there, where you may have to be a turtle with your social emotional learning program, uh, or you may have second step or Sam Carter. And so now New York has a common framework across all 16 countries that talks about things like social awareness, how we work, so personal responsibility, goal directed behavior. And that's going to be the first step to sustaining high quality social emotional learning process. I mean, I think one, one main question I've heard from educators about it is like, this is like one, you know, the, the common reaction to it is like, it's one more thing on my plate that I'm, asking, that I'm asking students to do, like, I, you know, may or may not, like, really appreciate the idea of, like, doing another assessment with students, and it also really depends on educators having, like, a good sense of, like, what each of their students' social and emotional capacities were, and I think that was especially challenging last year, because they hadn't met, like, a lot of their students, and a lot of their students hadn't been in a school building in a while, so I'm just wondering, like, and feel free for others to feel free to weigh in too, but like what can be done to sort of like do that at scale in a way that doesn't just feel like another mandate that's kind of like raining down on the teacher to address this like sort of nebulous problem? So I would just, so anything that's rolled out to scale can't be done in here. <laughs> I, I, I'll say that, and I'll say they did an amazing job for what they were trying to do this year. Um, they started with teachers and teachers reporting on skill sets that they saw in the classroom. And again, there were some challenges that were related to that. Um, the DESA in and of itself has got a three-tiered reporting system. It's parents, it's students, and it's another adult who knows, specifically teachers. 
that child. So at full force, they get three different reports, and they'll get a much more multi-dimensional understanding of where a child might need some support in their social emotional learning. Um, so I think we have to remember that, again, it's not going to happen all of a sudden, and if you're trying to change 